I think the inflation dynamics have maybe shifted slightly in the U.S. We don't see really any possibility for the Fed to be cutting rates until next year. I think there's a risk they cut faster than the market thinks. It's clear that the future is going to be different than the past, i.e., for sure, higher rates for longer. We need to stick to our work that tells us that a recession is likely to unfold. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keen and Lisa Abramowitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market on the S&P 500 positive by 0.2 percent getting your week started looking ahead to a big week for retail in america tomorrow morning retail sales on wednesday earnings from target thursday from walmart but how many times have we done this through august starting this morning stateside tom talking about china yeah, china uh, the china, headline once china, again china it's there and amaletti just talking and he opening there you know getting all zen on us as well guess what it starts and ends in china with a set of news. What's interesting to me about China is it's not one story. You got to get briefed on this to get up to speed on three, four, five stories about China. The summary is simple it's Chinese equities in the tank, iron ore somewhat in the tank. There's a lot of moving parts going on in China, and that redounds right back to Jay Powell at Jackson Hole. Woke up this morning going from headline to headline, yeah. and that's the way we start this morning once again. One Chinese developer, a name you're familiar with, Country Garden Holdings, seeking to extend a maturity bond for the first time ever. Away from that, we've got a wealth manager missing payments, Lisa. This all starting to mount in a bigger way. Which raises a question of when this becomes financial contagion that really affects China, and then that affects the broader market, whether it's in the U.S. or whether it's in Europe. <clears throat> Why are we not seeing more sort of trickle out effects of we that? Are. Well, is that what we're seeing in Germany? Is that what we're seeing in yeah. parts of Europe? But a lot of U.S. companies, yes, they are rationing back their expectations for growth in China. Beyond that, where do you uh, see the I, contagion? I see it in the terminal. I see yen going out to new yen weakness right up buttressed on 145 or in Minbi. Obviously, the Chinese yuan is right back to recent uh, weakness as well. And I see it in a 30-year bank rate mortgage. I mean, here's the number, folks. This morning, there's many different mortgage rates, 7.53%. I think you can round that up to 8%, but I'm not there yet. Do you see stress in the bond market, in treasuries? Last three weeks, yields are higher for 30 basis points. 30 basis points <coughs> higher in three weeks. Lisa, I'm with you. Eight years ago, you get headlines like this out of China. This bond market's bid. Treasuries are rallying. Yields are aggressively lower. The last three weeks, yields are higher. Life above 4%. Can we sustain life above 4% on a 10-year? It's a great question, especially in light of weakness that people feel coming from China and then the sort of surprising resilience of the U.S. consumer. It's such an interesting dichotomy that we get a slew of Chinese data, which we'll go through in a second, pointing to all of this weakness that we keep hearing about so and seeing evidence of. And then we see also the consumer and what the U.S. consumer keeps doing, which is spend, 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 even if it's above their means. There's some so, real tension out there, TK. Look at what's happening with crude. We're so, talking about a okay. China slowdown every single morning. Deflation, disinflation, bad economic data. Crude's up more than 20% off the June lows. Bring, bring it, as you, mentioned, you mentioned retail earnings today. We'll bring it back to my 201K. What do you do if you're in stocks? And you're listening to all this talk about macro babble. I'm not quite sure what I do. Well, what a lot of people are doing is they are diversifying, right? They're going into commodities, which raises a question. How long can you continue to go into some of these areas if China ends up being the major macro story that people are not paying enough attention to? Really fascinating time. You don't get a quiet summer. We're getting deeper into summer. Jackson Hole about 10 days away. Yeah, it's an interesting yeah, it's time, very, TK. It's, it's, it's very zen. The we're future's going to be different to the past. It's, it's true. true. We've got a 12 hour. Should I go hiking? He <laughs> said Jackson? it was zen. Yeah. It's very zen. Should I go hiking in Jackson Hole? You're going hiking next week? Well, we got like a I'll 12 hour window, and you know. I Lisa goes hiking. Get my, my stick. Yeah, if you're over Lisa went canoeing stick. last year canoeing in last. Jackson Hole. I've got big plans this year. Yeah. Have you? But there's snakes. Right? <laughs> canoeing again. <laughs> well, if you go hi seriously, if you go hiking in Wyoming, there's snakes, right? And snakes, bears. bears, elk. All but of the above. snakes. Snakes? Is like that what rabbits. I'm worried about? You're more concerned about the snakes. Oh, yeah. Okay. Like where we sleep. We don't stay, folks. You know, we're staying oh. like a Motel <laughs> whoa, 6. Whoa, whoa, whoa. We are not staying in a Motel 6, number one. And number two, what, you think that a snake is going to get into your room? I, when I walk into my room, I'm looking under the bed to see if there's snakes there sleeping. I'm staying in a different hotel to you. Are you? Yeah. You're, you're probably in the Ritz. Right? Let's get to the price action. The Amangani. <clears throat> Very nice. <laughs> <laughs> Equity futures on the S&P 500 up by 0.2%. Equities advancing today. First back-to-back -back weekly loss on the Nasdaq 100 
of the year so far. How about that for a stat? The first back-to-back -back weekly losses for the NASDAQ 100 for the year so far, closing out last week for a week of losses as well on the S&P 500. Yields above 4% on a closing basis. Thank you, Stuart Kaiser, for this stat out of City. Above 4% on a closing basis for a ninth consecutive session. And Lisa, going back over time, it's actually quite rare to see that. Especially at a time when a lot of people are arguing that we're going to go back to a low inflation kind of uh, moment. And you've got Goldman Sachs calling for rate cuts, which we'll get into uh, in the second quarter. As far as today, it is light ahead of a week of really dominated by retail sales. But I am focused on China. Today, James Bullard is leaving his role as St. Louis Fed president to become dean of Purdue University's business school. He was actually one of the most novel voices. He was a hawk. Are there hawks left? What does a hawk on the Fed right now mean at a time where they're looking for a soft landing? At 5 p.m., Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is speaking in Las Vegas. This is the tour that we see from all Biden officials talking about the Inflation uh, Reduction Act and what this can do for the U.S. economy. Curious to see what she says about China, though, especially in light of this. 10 p.m., China is releasing July economic data, including industrial production, retail sales, and jobless information. This comes at a time when broader markets have largely shrugged off China. Can they continue to, John? At what point does the data supersede the calm of a soft landing in the U.S.? So we've got to do three things this morning. Talk about China, talk about retail sales later this week from companies and the official data itself, and talk about developments in this bond market. Lisa, thank you. Let's kick it off with Ben Laidler, global market strategist over at eToro. Ben, let's talk about this bond market. Life above 4% on a 10-year. Can it be sustained? And ultimately, what does it mean for your equity market? Uh, I don't think it can be sustained. Uh, you look at two percent real yields. We when we, we have, you've got to go back fifteen years to see them being reasonably sustainable to before the global financial crisis. You look at this four percent U.S. GDP now cast we've got. You've got to go back you know twenty years outside of the pandemic. So I I, I think this is pretty much the top. Um, and and I'd, absolutely, I'd absolutely be leaning leaning against this. I think the deflationary forces are still out there. We've had a bit of a sort of reset. Um, given uh, you know, growth has actually been firmer than expected. We've had this sort of headline last week of this turn up in, um, in, uh, in, in inflation. But I, I'd absolutely be leaning against this. I'd be looking to sort of bottom fish a little bit, if that's the right terminology, after the massive rally we've seen. In, in, in tech, I still think um, sort of long-duration yeah. assets are a place to be. Uh, ben, the Wall Street Journal, I believe on Friday, had a wonderful article looking at five retirees, each of them with five million each, four million, five million, and the constant theme of these five different families was they bought tech, they owned tech, they stayed with tech. The heart of your note is you say tech is not going to tank, that tech has more in the tank. How do you look at tech and say they got legs to continue? Look at the earnings season we've just seen. Where did the growth surprises come from? Where did the absolute growth come from. It came from all these sort of tech heavy sectors, consumer discretionary communications and, and IT itself. I mean, these are secular growth sectors, um, which are seeing some top line growth, but are also had a lot of fat to cut. Um, and I think you're beginning to see that come together. So to the extent that US equities get led out of this earnings recession, and this earnings trough we've just seen, uh, I think we've got the sort of glimmers of hope that it's tech that's going to lead. And on the valuation side, I think bond yields back off. Um, and that'll take, I think, the ceiling off valuations that you've had put on over the last uh, over the last month or so. John was just talking about how you've seen a 10 year yield above 4 percent for nine consecutive sessions. At what point do you start to rethink just how far uh, the yield can fall? And that makes you reassess your whole call when it comes to the equity space. Yeah, obviously, if it goes much higher, or the, you know, all the fundamentals actually change, and I, I don't think they have. I think a lot of this bond yield move is, is technical. You know, a lot of issuance, what well, the changes what we've seen out of Japan. Um, you know, I look at our sort of fundamental growth indicators; and they actually haven't changed that much. I look at the you know the gold copper ratio; it's basically flat. So I'm a little, and as I say, you know, these numbers: this four percent now cast on GDP, these two percent real yields. Um, you know, those are really top of the ranges that you look back long term. I'd be very surprised if we sort of break through that. I, you know, I'm happy to take a, um, a move sideways from here, but I, I, I think the medium term direction is down. And that gives me some confidence, along with the earnings in tech, uh, to be sort of nibbling at this pullback.
You say that it seems really technical in nature, and yet it's been accompanied with seven straight weeks of gains on the crude uh, level. We've seen a real rally into commodities more broadly, um, this idea of some sort of consumer rebound and resilience that we keep seeing in the U.S. How do you sort of pair this with the idea of a China slowing? I mean, how do you basically look at the commodity space and say the yield move has completely been technical? I haven't completely been technical, but, but you're right to flag oil, right? I think there are sort of two clear and present dangers currently for U.S. markets. Oil's the second one. This 70 cents rise we've had off the gasoline price low in the U.S. Uh, is a sort of double negative, right? It takes about 100 billion out of consumer spending, which is four Macy's, just to put it in perspective. And it'll start pushing up consumer you know, inflation expectations. <laughs> but, but I do think it ultimately is self-correcting. I think the higher oil prices go... The more people are going to worry about growth, the more people are going to worry about interest rates. And, and I think that'll cool the demand side. Uh, you know, China, China's a big deal in oil markets, but it's only 15, 16 right. percent. Right? It's a much bigger deal in industrial metals. And that's where you've been seeing uh, that's where you've been seeing the weakness. So I, I think we're right to worry a little bit about oil. But I do think it's self-correcting. And I do think you know, a lot of the rally you've seen has just been the tightness on the supply side. Uh, <laughs> but I think you know, demand weakness will follow. If Brent stays above 85 for very long. Ben, quickly here, your acclaim is late 2018. You had the courage to look out 18 months. How do you look out 18 months from here and own and at the margin acquire shares? Yeah, looking to 2024, what's going to be happening? I think we're going to get double digit earnings growth relative to the minus five we're seeing right now. I think we're going to have the Fed cutting interest rates. Uh, and that will support valuations. Those are the only two ways to make money in markets. I think valuations are going to stay high, maybe not go higher. And we're going to have a 15 percent swing in earnings over the next uh, over the next 12 months. That, that's how you make money. You make it sound so easy, Ben. Ben Laidler, Abby Toro. Ben, thank you. It's got to catch up to kick off the trading week. I read the same article. I thought you were going to say the one thing they had in common, Tom, was that they were all broke, even though they had saved up five, six million dollars. Didn't you get the same same thing in that article? One hundred percent. I read the same thing. We all did. I give the journal really great marks of this. They've they've really made a commitment to talking to people of all different socioeconomic outlooks on retirement. Some of it is not pretty. There's a huge part of America struggling. These people aren't struggling. These five families with five. One guy's his wife died three weeks after he retired. I mean, imagine that brutal. But but the one thing I saw there was at some point they all decided to just buy, name the tech stock, and never sell it. That was a constant it. theme that I saw. So the Wall Street Journal did some great stuff over the weekend, Tom. That wasn't my favorite story. My favorite story was actually the scary math behind the Treasury market. Lisa, I was going through some of the numbers, and I can share some of the article with you right now. Just highlighting the CBO's forecast and actually highlighting that maybe it's too optimistic. It envisions the net interest rate paid on the debt is barely topping 3% in the coming years, even though short-term bills and notes yield more than 5% today. And Lisa, some of this is quite actually, it's worrying when you start to look at it, just how much the interest payments will actually equate to non-discretionary or rather discretionary non-defence spending in the years to come. It's it's pretty amazing. So Peter Shear read this and he put out a note and he was talking about this article. And on one hand, he was saying, well, it seems a bit extreme to us. And yet the details aren't wrong. And you read through it and it is concerning. And he said he has to really think about his longer term bond yield called. At what point do people reassess how long they can shrug off fundamentals that they've been able to shrug off for so many years and say this time is different with increasingly disparate markets in terms of buyers and in terms of economies? So it goes back to that question that I shared with Ben Laidler moments ago. Can we sustain life above 4%? And who does it hurt first? The sovereign or corporates? What's most at risk here? The balance sheets of corporations that have locked this in for a long time and the high yield players will ultimately refinance in the years to come. Or the sovereign, which may experience the squeeze as well. Well, obviously, they're, they're somewhat interrelated, but I would argue some people are saying it's the sovereign more than the corporate. That's what we're seeing more and more, saying high, go into a Google bond, you're probably going to get your money back. The U.S., you could be subject to all sorts of political shenanigans. You'll get your money back, but you could get, you know, locked up in some sort of government shutdown. Did you know the future will be different to the past? I've heard that, you know. I don't, I'm not sure. I'm really thinking about oh, it. TK, thank you for that. Like Maletti, over at- Sebastian Page at T. Rowe Price is coming up from New York City. Good morning. I think this is all 
kind of nonsensical theater. I've made that clear to the RNC as well, way back, um, bef even before I entered this race, that I thought the pledge was a bad idea. Um, and Donald Trump is now playing that game, but that's what he does. I would not be the least bit surprised if sometime around Sunday or Monday of next week um, that he signs the pledge and he shows up on the stage on Wednesday. The first debate is next Wednesday, a week Wednesday. That was Chris Christie, Republican presidential candidate on ABC over the weekend. The question remains the same. Will the former president be on that stage in Milwaukee? From New York City this morning, good morning to you all. Getting your week started with the equity market shaping up as follows on the S&P 500. Two weeks of losses on the S&P, trying to bounce up by a quarter of 1%. Concerns in China once again, missed payments, all that kind of bad stuff. Yields unchanged on a 10-year, 4.1581. And just a quick sneak peek of what's happening in foreign exchange, TK, the euro, 109.51 against the dollar, and basically unchanged. Yeah, I kind of call it basically unchanged, but again, there's a tension to the market, John. I just simply want to go back to things that are buttressed right up against support or resistance, depending on what the chart is. And one of those is a 10-year real yield. I'm not at 180. I'm not at 181, but we've come back to an inflation east to kind of 1.78%. That's not to be ignored. You want to talk about some tension just briefly. <clears throat> Did you read that New York Magazine article on David Solomon going into the weekend? Speaking of brutal, is... let me share the headline with you if you missed this Please. going into the weekend. Is David Solomon too big a jerk to run Goldman Sachs? Tom, when have you seen a headline like that around a financial institution? When was no, the last time you saw anything like that? That is the correct point. Um, I, this broke on Friday, folks. For those of you internationally, this is a huge deal within New York and, frankly, within, global, within American Wall Street. And it's a combination of a New York Times article, business insider Lynette Lopez writing about his alma mater, Hamilton College, and some students were upset in that. But then the bombshell in, in, the, in the reporter for the New York, Ma New York Magazine, not New York Times, is really respected. I think that's the heart of the matter. This is not some journalist running around trying to make headlines. She's the real deal, Jen Weschner. You don't write an article like this unless a lot of people are unhappy with the leader of a company. That is the bottom line. And I think that what you have to wonder right. is at what point this sort of <clears throat> issue and questions and around his leadership become well, a bigger Lisa, problem let me for the ask you this, because John and I are just TV radio animals, and you're not. You're the real deal from print. As Srinath Arajan told me, he said, there wasn't all that much new in the New York Magazine article, but it was the language that was placed into sort of a hip, funky magazine versus something serious like Bloomberg News or New York Times. The language was shocked. John, the language was shocked. I mean, it was scathing. Let's do the sporting analogy. If this was a U.S. sports team right now, we'd be talking about a manager that's lost the locker room, correct? That's yes. what it feels like right now. Yeah, we call Ex that except Tottenham, but we won't go What's there. intriguing about this, and Mike Mayo of Wells Fargo is quoted in the yes. story, and he basically says, I've called for managers to leave in the past, for CEOs to leave. He's not made that call this time around. This feels so personal within the bank. Away from the performance yeah, I... of the quarterly numbers, this feels very personal within the the bank. And that was a lot of people's yeah. takeaway, including my own, from that story going into the weekend. You, want, you wonder where this is going into the weekend, going into the week. How do you stagger into September uh, with this kind of cloud around any given firm? I mean, the cloud around Morgan Stanley is who's going to replace Gorman. I get it. Well, that's different. It's a derby. It's different. This is on a whole nother um, scale. Uh, what we're going to do right now is migrate. It's uh, state fair season. Uh, Bramo is our state fair expert. If she was in Iowa at 11 a.m. this morning, the milking demonstration, John and Emily Putney Family Cattle Barn, milking parlor, north side of the cattle barn, was what you do. Like cattle, they showed up this weekend to do the politics of Iowa. That would be selected Republicans. We go all state, far, uh, state farm, I should say, or state fair with Isaac Boltanski, director of policy research at BT. IG. It's a silly season. Are they kissing babies out there? What are they doing besides uh, 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 gazing at the, the cattle and kissing babies? What are the Republicans doing? Uh, they're beginning what's going to be a long and ugly fight, Tom. You know, look, there's a lot of this that's quaint, right? It's great to see a person who's running for president flipping your hamburger, right? A lot of this is, is good old school retail politics. But underneath the surface, there is a lot of disdain and a, a lot of uncertainty over how the next few months are going to go. Look, we have a debate next week for Republicans. We don't even know if we're going to have the leader in the polls, the right. former President Trump, 
participating. And so, look, I think it's quaint, it's cute, it's it's sometimes nice, but right. when you peel back that onion on your hot dog, <clears throat> you'll notice that it's pretty ugly and it's going to be a long few months. Isaac, you have the fabric of the Midwest in you, and of course with Ohio Wesleyan and all that. Is the Republican Party forever changed by former President Trump? You know, look, I, I will tell you this, Tom, I, I have a fun job. I get to talk to Democrats and Republicans. And what I find interesting is that both Democrats and Republicans, at least from the, the more establishment wings of each party, are largely unhappy with the candidate who's leading in the polls for them, right? And so Donald Trump is the presumptive nominee at this moment. Uh, he is leading in the polls by a wide margin. President uh, Biden is the presumptive nominee. He is uh, largely unchallenged, except for one challenge, which I think has not shown any uh, any running room in the polls. And so what I've noticed here is a, a frustration with the leading candidates that perhaps can lead to a, a change in sentiment over time. But, Tom, it's just hard to bridge that divide between what some party members hope and the numbers on the ground. And Donald Trump is going to get 30 plus percent of the Republican Party in a primary race, no matter what he does. And when you have this many winner-take-all primary states, which is what we're going to see this time around, he is the nominee until someone proves to me that it's going to be someone else. Isaac, I was reading a story over the weekend in the New York Times about the indictment effect, which is basically every indictment that comes out for Donald Trump basically boosts his popularity because it get, keeps him in the view of potential voters. How long does the indictment effect last? Look, then the next one that I think all of us are watching could come from Georgia, and there's there's um, conversations suggesting that the grand jury is going to hear from from folks this week uh, with an indictment as as early as the end of this week. Next week is what you continue to hear. I, I got to tell you, we have heard this phrase time and time again, Teflon Don, and I think that that has proven to be one of the truest. Um, uh, ways of thinking about this this former president. His uh, supporters simply don't care, and at times it gives them more fuel. For the average voter at the margin, it's not going to really change their opinion of him. If he's charged with RICO violations in Georgia, perhaps that, that gives him um, even more fuel to fight back against um, the the uh, the dark state, the the forces that are trying to stop him and hurt you. And it gives him the talking point that he wants. So to me, I continue to view these indictments primarily as political fodder that I think can give him more fuel on the campaign trail. You keep us up to speed here, Isaac. Let's go through them one by one. So New York is about falsifying business records. They're the allegations. Secret documents, that's Florida. Washington's January 6th. What's Georgia? So Georgia can be about, uh, It's it will be their state-level RICO um, a statute, and so that would allow the Fulton County uh, DA to pursue charges relating to the former president supposedly uh, pressuring state officials to falsify or overturn the election results uh, at the state level. And, and that one's really interesting because it isn't a federal charge. It's a state charge. So even if a Republican is in the White House in January 2025, you could not sweep it under the rug. And so that one has some unique powers. Furthermore, and, and this one I think is, is interesting as well, Georgia has been a little bit more willing to open up their courtrooms to cameras than New York or even the Fed. So that's also of interest. Interesting. Isaac, thank you, sir. Great. Isaac Bortansky <clears throat> of BTIG. I'm sure I'm not the only one, Tom, losing track of some of this over uh, the last few months. I, I, think, I think the nation, even the supporters of the former president, are just benumbed by the whole thing. I mean, this is to be polite, not normal, and I yearn for the way the British do it. I just, you know, can we do this in six weeks? It ain't going to happen. First debate a week away. At least we keep asking the same question. Is the former president showing up? We know that uh, the current president is showing up to Milwaukee t tomorrow, I believe, to talk about the Inflation Reduction Act, so trying to get ahead of the uh, uh, Republican debates. There is this question, though, how long can people be benumbed? And a larger question also, are people equally benumbed on both sides of the aisle to issues on both sides of the aisle. Does it sort of just become, okay, this is now the new status quo? Where is Anne-Marie? When's AMH back? Oh, I, I can't keep up. She's very European, isn't she? She's, she's so Euro. She's doing a Maria today. It's a full Is Maria. that what this is? It's a full today. Maria's taken the whole of August. They're off. like, four weeks or, let's do six weeks. Al Salinos of RBC is coming up from New York City. This is Bloomberg.
Two weeks of losses on the S&P 500. Here's the price action for you this Monday morning. Good morning, getting your week started on Bloomberg TV and Bloomberg Radio. Equity futures right now positive by 0.2%. The Nasdaq trying to bounce here. First back-to-back weekly loss to the Nasdaq 100 of the year so far. This morning positive by a third of 1%. All eyes on the Treasury market on a 10-year. Life above 4%. Can it be sustained? A move of 30 basis points higher over the previous three weeks. Yields are going nowhere this morning. 4.15 on a 10-year. On a 30-year this morning, down a single basis point at 4.25. Let's finish in the foreign exchange market. The euro shaping up as follows, unchanged as well, 109.48. That is the snoozer of a currency pair over the last month or so, Lisa. I think you can guess where that is every single day. <laughs> it's either 109 or 110. It seems like it was 110 for a couple of weeks. Now it's been 109. And you wonder this push-pull of who's going to blink first with the ECB or the Fed in terms of uh, stopping on rate hikes and continuing to start thinking about cutting. The ECB decision about a month away. Under surveillance this morning, China's banking regulator setting up, guess what, Tom? A task force to examine Zhongzhi, a top private wealth management firm in Beijing, after it missed payments on multiple high-yield investments. The regulator will assess the outstanding debt and risks at the firm, which manages more than $100 billion of assets. Tom, missed payments, take your pick. Right. We're talking about redoing the debt over at property developers uh, as well. There's a lot going on this morning in China. Yeah, what I would go to, John, here is this, the all-in guesstimate size here, and it's 100x billion, whatever, when you add it all up. But far more important than that is the what's the so what for Western viewers and listeners. And the so what, obviously, is week you won, but also Pacific Rim instability, where you get yen out to 145, and euro yen hasn't broken through. But I'm sorry, at 158.72, if you get strong euro, weak yen, out to one. 60, all of a sudden, these things in China matter. So it's the currency potential transmission mechanism, but there also is this transmission mechanism of at what point does this become a financial contagion issue hinging on the mortgage market, hinging on the property market, because a significant part of the holdings of this private wealth management was property in China. You start to wonder, when does this snowball, given how much leverage they have and how many of the problems are really percolating to the surface with authorities that either don't have the power or the will to counteract it? There's certainly some economic problems. Look at Tesla cutting prices again over in China. I know there's a separate EV story going on there, but sales of Tesla in China... Not great recently. Well, you've seen one company, U.S.-based company after another, talk about bringing down their estimates for sales in China. We saw that from Caterpillar. We saw that from a lot of other industrial companies. Why would Tesla be any different? There isn't the same will to spend. You could see a lot of Chinese consumers saving. They're hoarding money. Why? And this raises questions to longer-term uh, economic prowess. Let's turn to the next story. U.S. still rejecting a $7.25 billion takeover bid from rival Cleveland Cliffs, instead opting to begin a review of its strategic options. In a letter, U.S. still calling the quote, <laughs> calling the offer, quote, unreasonable. We'll have a conversation with the man behind that unreasonable offer, the CEO of Cleveland Cliffs, <clears throat> at about 11.40 Eastern time. That conversation, Lisa, later on this morning. OK, so here's the question. What do they have to propose? instead. And again, this goes to this question of, well, isn't scale really important? So what do they have to do? What does Cleveland Cliffs have to do to get U.S. steel? Wasn't clear to me about what happens with antitrust issues with this combination. What does happen? Is this something they allow? Well, evidently, if it's not tech, they don't mind. But I mean, but really, I mean, to be honest, there is a real question of at what point is the dominance of size at a time when the U.S. is trying to become an industrial behemoth matter (sighs) more? in terms of industrial policy. Look out for that conversation, Tom, later this morning. Those of us of an older persuasion are like, okay, they've made 4% per year for the last 10 years. They've made 2% per year, 3% per year for the last 20 years. Would somebody just put X out of its misery? It's sort of like... Why are we doing this? This hasn't been lost on a lot of people. You know, yeah. the, the ticker, Tom, that you just referenced, X, X. would maybe, become available maybe Mr. Oh, if Cleveland oh, Cliffs. Oh, man. Yeah. I, did, I, mean, I just yeah, stumbled yeah, into yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes I right? get lucky, folks, on a Monday. I stumble into brilliance. Yeah. Really, X would go to X. Elon. Well, you know, if, he's if, not if he wants it and he wanted to take the company. <laughs> <Maybe. laughs> we'll mention that a little bit later. Hasn't the Zuck Do taken the high to? ground? Yes. Yeah, on that issue. Zuck's yeah. having a massive. great six months. Mark Zuckerberg looks, looks like an adult. Yeah. Dare I say, looks like <laughs> Some would say everyone adult. looks like an adult, but we won't go there. Good morning, Mr. Musk. Tesla, I guess, <laughs> well, is you have, you have gone there. 
<laughs> We're going to go to a serious story. This is heartbreaking. Oh, this really is, Tom. The pictures over the weekend and over the last week or so, <clears throat> the death toll from wildfires in Hawaii approaching 100, making it the deadliest wildfires in the United States in more than 100 years. Years. Officials are expecting the death toll to climb further, TK, as search and rescue efforts continue. This was dry to begin with, and I'm really interested in the analysis out of this heartbreak about the trends here of the western part of each of the Hawaiian uh, islands uh, ab about what the new dry is. What's the new dry in the Mediterranean? What's the new dry in Spain? What's the new dry in western Maui? And how we have to change how we live. Now isn't the right time, Tom, <clears throat> for point scoring. Road, absolutely. Down the road, the inevitable conversation is going to happen. It's already starting, Lisa. Could it have been avoided? And what was missed? Should they have uh, sounded the alarm sooner? Would the alarms have helped if people were used to tsunamis and things like that and the alarms going off anyway? Should they have turned off the energy supply earlier since they were warned, the power company was warned? All of these questions. Now also, though, the key concern will be how do you rebuild, considering that this effort is going to cost, uh, cost incredible amounts of money and it's going to be a long time before they can invite tourists back to really foster their economy. Yeah, my, ba my amateur take on this at Maui and Lanai over to the west is it, it's – basically a manufactured tourism, like there's a Greg Norman golf course at the top of Lanai, and it's very green, and it's very watered. And then there's, what, what's the one, uh, Manelli Bay is down on Lanai. This is a bit away from Maui as well. It's very dry with green golf courses. And, you know, what, what do you do with a natural terrain and maybe climate change versus bringing in a lot of water? Again, way down the road from the immediate tragedy. That's the latest information I have, Tom, your top three stories this hour. <clears throat> we are going to migrate now to an important conversation. This is our conversation of the day on foreign exchange, the litmus paper of the system. Elsa Lingos brings serious ECB and EU cred to RBC Capital Markets, global head of foreign exchange strategy. Elsa, open question right now. What is your biggest mystery in sleepy August? You're the only one in Europe working. What's your biggest mystery right now forward in foreign exchange? I think you touched on it earlier, Tom, at the top of the hour, the uncertainty around what's going on in China. And part of the struggle for us as outsiders is trying to understand the reality on the ground when there's actually been a move away from sharing information, um, the underlying GDP data, the kind of the breakdown of components just isn't there. And on top of that, we just don't have the visibility onto these um, trouble developers and asset managers' balance sheets. Does China bring in instability? I was talking about euro yen to 160 and through strong euro weak yen. Dollar yen back up towards 150. Can you see that instability out there given the events in China? And I think people are reluctant to take positions. As you kind of mentioned, it's the middle of August. A lot of investors we speak to have just shut up shop, particularly if they've had a good summer so far. They're just not seeing the opportunities out there. You know, you've got FX very much in a tight range. I mean, euro dollar to the pip is almost exactly where it was a month ago. And even when we do attempt to get breakouts, as we did earlier um, in July, it just doesn't seem to follow through. And I think people are really struggling with that dynamic at the moment. It just leaves us all looking at carry trade and selling vol. Elsa, if everybody's just basically on the beach right now, does that mean when everybody comes back, you start to see more concern about the potential for contagion from China and all of the potential in financial instability in certain sectors? I think we need to see a bit more information. I mean, clearly the fact that you're seeing developers missing um, interest payments on their bonds has people concerned. But more than anything, you know, we've been in this situation, I mean, I could go back 10 years when people were panicking about the big China cliff and suddenly growth was going to collapse. And there've been people that have cried wolf one too many times. And so markets are just naturally reluctant to believe that this time it could be happening for real. What I think we're missing in order to get bigger trends is a bit of global divergence. You know, at the moment, it feels like a lot of the themes are affecting a lot of countries in a very similar fashion. If I look at developed markets in particular, whether it's the ECB or the Fed or the Bank of Canada, the RBA, they all seem to be in very similar positions. We need that to break down and diverge in order to get those trends. But aren't we seeing that in the actual data, Elsa? And I'm talking about, for example, the U.S. and Europe, Germany in particular. We are seeing that divergence. We're just not seeing it when it comes to a currency that seems to have flatlined because everyone's on vacation. I mean, it's a great question, Lisa, because even more so than the currency, what I find really perplexing is if you look ahead, you look at 2024 expectations, 
there's still this widespread consensus that the euro area is going to outperform the US. And cyclically, that doesn't doesn't seem to add up at the moment. I mean, yes, the Fed has delivered more <coughs> tightening, but the US also delivered a whole lot more fiscal stimulus. And actually, the tightening delivered by the US is not that much more than the ECB for the kind of local um, realities on the ground. So I do think eventually we will get that unexpected break lower in euro dollar. That's not the consensus. Everybody's looking for it to trade up at 113 by year end. I just think we may need to wait for the autumn for that to really start taking hold. I need to rip up the script, Elsa Lingos, and I can do this with you. There's a number of ways to look at the fiction known as a Russian ruble, dollar ruble, euro ruble, and also a basket of ruble. I'm just going to go to the headline drama, Elsa Lingos, of dollar as compared to Russian ruble through 100. I just did a log regression of it back 20 years, excuse me, back to 07. Elsa, what do I make of the newly weakened ruble? What does it signal given the lack of flows, the inform lack of information that we have? And it's very clear that if this is a war of attrition, that puts Russia in a weaker state vis-a-vis um, -vis the rest of the world. You know, the fact that it relies on foreign currency, hard currency in order to buy um, whether it's military goods and so on. Um, and then it relies on help from partners. You know, it relies on high oil prices. And we've seen oil trying to break higher, but it's not really following through. And so I do think that in terms of that war of attrition, it does all else equal, just put Russia in a slightly weaker spot. Can you read <clears throat> anything in terms of capital flows? Almost certainly not. You know, it's a yeah. highly kind of controlled currency at the moment. But it's unraveling. I'm not going to say it's a Zimbabwe equivalent because it's not, or, you know, even the complexities of the Turkish lira. Uh, how do they respond to it, or does no one care? I don't think there is a response as such. I mean, it's it's a very different economy to even, say, the Turkish lira, where it's a, an economy, that Turkey is an economy that's dependent on commodity imports. I mean, being in a position where you're a commodity exporter does put you in a position of relative strength. And so there will always be some hard currency coming in. Um, and so in that sense, the currency, the ruble is less of a signal for the underlying strength or state of the Russian economy. Asselinos. Thank you. Of RBC, Capital Markets on the latest in the FX market. Note just dropped in the inbox from Jordan Rochester over at Nomura. Throwing in the towel on his long euro call, he says take profit. Previous target was 114 by the end of September with 116 next year likely. Goes for a range of reasons as to why you should be long the euro. But ultimately, Tom, things have been contained, haven't they? There is some serious risk emerging with what is happening over in China and what's developing in the commodity market for the continent as well, going deeper into summer and out looking into winter. Yeah, you know, I think there's a lot of different stories here. I mean, one, one of them, I think Rochester's not thinking clearly after what Newcastle United did, but, the, you know, the, the, the bottom the line here is it's range-bound, as Elsa Lingo's talked about, and you sort of got to get a belief, a setup, a view out 18 months, and it's really difficult to do that right now. I think Rochester's job, Elsa Lingo's job, is really difficult. Well, let's go right back now. seven months, and Lisa's brought this up a few times. Seven months ago, I'm sitting there in London, ask a cast of characters who hikes more this year. Just ridiculous conviction around the ECB hiking more than the Federal Reserve in 2023. Going into September, what happens after September, Lisa? A complete lack of conviction. That's the difference between now and then. Which also is the difference with the economic picture, which it's much weaker than people had expected back then. El Salino's uh, kind of joining with Jordan Rochester there, seeing a break it to the weaker side of euro dollar because there isn't the same strength, because they didn't have the same stimulus that the U.S. had. And yet they raised rates almost the same amount, right? I mean, she was saying if you look at what they're doing, it's actually more tightening, especially given some of the transmission mechanisms. China's much weaker than we thought it would be, Tom. And as a consequence, yeah, to some extent, Europe is as well. The upside to prices <laughs> have come from yeah, the United States. Balance sheet weaker as well. It's not about flows and income statement. John, not moments ago, but in the last couple hours, yen prints a 145 versus dollar. That's a an emotional point. You emotional? Yeah, very emotional. And Carsten Bresky of ING is coming up mm -hmm. from New York City. This I is Bloomberg. We don't see really any possibility for the Fed to be cutting rates in, until next year, and that's even under, I think, a fairly benign scenario for the outlook for inflation. 
uh, they're really going to want to see a trend in the headline figure. You know, it is moving in that direction, but we have a long ways to go before we get to 2%. That was Daniel Morris of BNP Paribas Asset Management. As we get deeper into the summer and start to think about Jackson Hole, the Federal Reserve annual get-together just a week or so away. Going into that, your equity market on the S&P 500, the scores this Monday morning as follows. Positive by a third of 1% on the S&P. No real drama this morning, stateside Tom, and the bond market pretty much unchanged on a 10-year. 415, now that level <coughs> is an interesting one. Getting closer and closer to the post-SVB failure intraday high of about 420. That's out there. I'm glad, yeah. About five basis points away. Is the bank, are we beyond the banking crisis? And People that was hope a we secondary are. debate this weekend, but nevertheless there it is. Well, I like that you said that that was a secondary debate because a lot of people, including Morgan Stanley analysts, were coming out and saying, we can't really say it's over, especially with the Moody's downgrade. And I started to think, okay, is this basically the new gig for rating agencies is just to turn up the volume to your language, John, on certain issues and then people suddenly have to care about them again? Three issues. Funding costs, capital. What was the third one? Commercial real estate. So I guess you, don't have to, you don't have to remember the third one. Commercial real estate is something that's going to linger over this sector for small and medium-sized banks, you'd imagine, Lisa, for the time being, for the foreseeable future. And so this is the reason why you're going to have some of these names bleed lower at the same time. No one's talking about a crisis, and so now we have to start thinking about, okay, well, can yields stay at this level? And if that's the case, is this a soft but landing I, or is this sticky inflation? Are we at the price where you don't do a conventional yield analysis and you flip over to do a price analysis? If I have a mortgage rate at 7.53 percent, Price adjusts, amount you can spend on a house adjusts, how much house I can buy, etc. That hasn't happened. Same thing hasn't happened. And I, I wonder in commercial real estate when this gives way. When's it give way? When high yield or you know sort of garbage IG bonds actually have a huge yield, which again means price down. When the refinancing starts, yeah, 2025 yeah. at another year or so. Yeah. I can't speak to commercial real estate on that mortgage issue, Tom, but for residential. Yeah. For people at home sitting in houses with very low mortgage rates, this, how do you feel about this them? market's frozen. They're not going to sell. Yeah, how do you and feel about that? And people can't buy with rates of 7 or 8%. You know how I feel about it. <laughs> well, there was a lot of What did the New York Times? I know. I, I know they it. New York like, Times you know. at the end wrote of the article. They called it mortgage envy, didn't yeah, yeah, they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was mortgage like, oh, envy. I know I know who they're writing about. I know. <laughs> citing John Farrow. I'm pleased I was inspiration. <laughs> you were inspiration for a New York Times article. This weekend, citing a Farrow sighting at Match Outdoors there on their little French tables that they have on 64th Street. He's going, you want what for... You know, insane. 3,000 square feet or whatever. What I did this weekend was simple. I'm starting to learn the map of Germany, that Munich is 355 miles. You go north to Bremen. Is that how you pronounce it? I'm really ignorant on this. Okay. I, I, no, no pride here. August 18th, Friday. Is this about Verder, your, your lost son, Verder, Harry? Bre yeah, Werder Bremen plays <laughs> Bayern Kane. And, you know, I'm learning about Bundesliga. And I called up um, uh, Councillor Amy and I said, you know, we got to book somebody on Bundesliga. So... You know, we did. You made that book in. If you, you know, it's like Luton. Does our next guest know that he's talking uh, about Harry Kane? Our, our, our next guest yeah, got does. relegated. His team got relegated huh. in Bundesliga football, and it's the only. You know, that's why Karsten Bresky's with us, global head of macro research at ING. Your Berliner team, Karsten, got relegated as well. Let me cut to the chase before we get to serious ING work. Is this league the same as Premier League? Is Harry Kane going to go in and get three goals a game, or does he have his work cut out for him? No, but he played for Bayern Munich. But the bad thing is, Tom, he actually lost the very first match already on Saturday. That was the Super Cup against uh, Leipzig. So it was in, in, in 0 3. Um, so it was not a good start for Bayern Munich and Harry Kane. See how we do this? It's just, our, I'm going to tear up here. Amy is so good to get this. We bring Bundesliga. I can't. I can't go forward, Lisa. Bring Karsten in. I'm <laughs> you. I can't talk. Okay. I'll volunteer. Yeah. <laughs> Karsten, I'm not going to talk about the Bundesliga. Maybe another time. I am curious, though, about what Elsa Linus was talking about with respect to divergence. And we've been talking about that for a while. When will the economic divergences play out and market divergences? Are we seeing market divergences with the economies of the U.S., of Europe, and of China? Well, of course we do see them um, because the U.S. is doing much better and everyone fears this soft landing, hard landing, but it hasn't happened so far. Um, with Europe, I, th I think there are still there are a couple of people, including the ECB, still too optimistic because here we have the problem of not only cyclical headwind, but also structural transition. So I, my, my best bet currently is that uh, Europe is in for a longer stagnation, like my favorite soccer club. Um, and China, a third one, is, um, is, is clearly also 
also in this very long soft patch. So there is global divergence. I think it's the very first time for a long while that, we've, that we're seeing and witnessing this big divergence. Have we fully appreciated how much of the weakness that we're seeing in China is bleeding over into the Europe, or European economic picture? Not entirely, I think. Plus, I think we have not fully factored in the fact that, that China no longer plays the same role for Europe as it did in the past, um, especially for, for Germany. Because I think in the past, China was almost in a symbiotic relationship with the German economy. So there was big need for, for made in Germany products. Um, so, but this time around, when you look at the export data, also when you look at the fact that China is able to produce the same products these days, as Germany or other European manufacturers are producing, um, China is no longer playing the same, the same role as it did in the past. At the same time, with this weakening domestic economy in China, <coughs> Europeans will not sell their exports. Karsten, what will flows do? What I most focused on this weekend was foreign direct investment. And obviously the headlines are in the dearth of foreign direct investment into China. What do you presume will be FDI between Europe and America or Europe and China? Well, between the U.S. and Europe, it is clearly turning to net positive for the U.S. <laughs> um, we have been seeing already a trend of, of FDIs coming into Europe um, declining. And at the same time, this Inflation Reduction Act in the U.S. is clearly triggering um, foreign direct investments from European companies going into, into the U.S. Well, when you look at um, U.S. China, also Europe China, I think we will see clearly a um, reduction in both U.S. and European FDIs going into China, simply due to de-risking and the right. new geopolitical situation. So critically here, and in, in with the news flow of the last number of weeks, can you get on board with the IMF's five-year lassitude, the lethargy, the, the, the lack of global trade, just the dampening of the economy out to 2028. Can you get on board with that? I can definitely get on board with that because I think this is pretty much the reality. Well, you don't, don't call this the end of globalization, but I think we should call this the end of globalization as we knew it. Um, so global trade is clearly slowing down. We will see more regional trade popping up. Um, but uh, with global trade slowing down, being much more sluggish, um, it is obvious that the countries that benefited the most in the past from global trade, and we have a couple of Europeans, I'm living in one of those, um, they will be hit the hardest from this end of globalization as we knew it. So, Carsten, the German model, what's left of it? How do they change? Well, there is not a lot left of it, um, other than, I don't know, um, currently buying um, English players to get to the Bundesliga. <laughs> no, um, I, I, I re re really think this is, and, and not everyone has realized it yet in, in German politics, um, this business model has come to an end, a business model that was highly depending on export growth and that was also highly depending on importing low energy. Um, so with this new world, we will see also a restructuring of the German business model. And of course, then you have two narratives. Huh? There is one where you think, all right, maybe German manufacturers, German industry can still embrace new technologies, sustainability, renewables, and then can kind of, you know, rise again after a couple of years. The other one would be a global economy that is moving more towards services. And to tell you the truth, the German economy is definitely not strong when it comes to services. Carsten, thank you, sir, on the next act for Germany and Europe. Carsten Bresky there, the global head of macro research at ING. Germany and that model, Tom, to well, outsource defense to America, to outsource energy <coughs> security to Russia, to outsource economic security to China. Yeah. It's almost a fail across the board. I have two things there. What I observed from Karsten Bresky, and I, again, I'm learning a lot about this. I mean, it's just very simple. He said Byron Cain would not be relegated this year, which I think is, you know, an important piece of information. It's a headline this morning. It's a headline. But the okay. other thing I see here, and I think Lisa and I got to give you a massive victory lap on this. You were the first one I heard, John, who said, what does this say about the 14X year heritage of Angela Merkel? You were the first one I hear talk about that, and I think that's going to be a source of serious academic analysis I wasn't over the alone. next decade. I wasn't alone. It was many years ago. But ultimately, too many people got too cosy with the views of the Chancellor in Germany.
and it's a lot of blowback and we're still feeling it today. Sebastian Page at T. Rowe Price coming up next from New York City. Features higher. Good morning. I think the inflation dynamics have maybe shifted slightly in the U.S. We don't see really any possibility for the Fed to be cutting rates until next year. I think there's a risk they cut faster than the market thinks. I think there are lags of monetary policy that will very slowly but surely slow down the economy. We need to stick to our work that tells us that a recession is likely to unfold. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell and Lisa Abramowitz. Getting your week started live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Brambitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market on the S&P 500 positive here by a quarter of 1%. We've talked a lot about this week, dominated by retail results. Walmart Thursday, Target Wednesday, retail sales tomorrow morning. The next stop, Tom, ahead of Jackson Hole, Wyoming and the Federal Reserve annual get-together a week away. The central banker to the world, I mean, it's just great. I mean, you and I are standing there and we're on the split rail fence and there they come down the line it will be Lagarde Paul maybe Ueda will show up in Bramo they'll all be there all going out them. to wave to the elk <laughs> in a bear suit you, you got to see it to believe it folks we'll bring in full coverage of that our team will have team coverage of the wave is Chairman Powell will point out as central banker to the world. And what he's going to point out to it, he's going to go somewhere out there is a 150 Japanese yen. Moments ago, we got a 145 on Japanese yen, weaker yen, a proxy for Asia. And they'll be talking about that, the yield curve confusion. <laughs> YCC over at the BOJ. Do you like that, Lisa? Yes. In Europe, they'll be talking about the disappointing economic growth. And in China, I would have to say, real financial turbulence coming to the surface, Lisa, just a little bit more over the weekend. There's such an interesting tension setting up this week because we've got that weakness in China that also has contagion uh, paired with what everyone's expecting to be the resilient U.S. consumer. The retail sales that are expected to show that people are still out there spending and that they have money to spend, even though they've whittled down their savings rates. So which wins? And this goes to the battle of underpinning the yield space, right? Can yields keep rising with that overhang of a potential <clears throat> contagion coming no. from China, coming from weakness overseas? I'm going to go to a price analysis, which is at some point you have, you know, the street and words guilty of this. You look at a yield analysis, oops, until price comes down enough where it's like, oh, I'm losing money. How close are we to the Oh, I'm losing money. You can quantify that any way you want. I think a lot of people have lost money in the yeah. credit market, Tom. Like a three-year bond bear market? Is that what we're talking about? And That I don't know about, but I think we have to highlight some of the moves we've seen so far <coughs> over the last few weeks. One is crude, massive move off the June low of more than 20%. That's worth highlighting. The other is in the bond market. The long end on a 10-year yields up by 30 basis points in three weeks. And Lisa, you ask five different people what is behind that bond market move? And they will give you five different reasons what is behind that bond market move. With some people just dismissing it as a technical uh, sort of blip that doesn't make a lot of sense, right? And then you have other people saying, no, this is the key risk for the Federal Reserve, that they stay on hold, they are complacent with some sort of soft landing, and inflation restarts to accelerate. We've heard that from Jim Bianco. We've heard that from a whole host of other people as well, including Neil Dutta. And at what point do we see the data to edify that kind of idea? Probably when it's too late for the Fed to respond. Let's run through the scores this morning, this Monday morning. Equity futures, just about positive by a quarter of 1% on the S&P 500. <clears throat> There's that move above 4% on a 10-year yield. We stay there, Lisa. Unchanged on a session at the moment. Your 10-year yield, 4.15 on a 10 yeah. Today's quiet ahead of a big week for retail sales in particular. Today, James Bullard is leaving his role as St. Louis Fed president. He's becoming the dean of Purdue University's business school. I think it's interesting to note his departure because he's been such a loud and sometimes contrarian voice and has been hawkish of late. Who are the hawks remaining on the Federal Reserve? 5, 5 p.m., Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is deployed to Las <coughs> Vegas to talk about the Inflation Reduction Act, which is going to be a big uh, sort of drumbeat this week from the Biden administration. Administration. He heads to Milwaukee tomorrow. And at 10 p.m., this really is the key point to me. China is releasing a slew of economic data for the month of July. 
industrial production, retail sales, jobless claim or jobless data. How much do we see this ongoing weakening and how does that play out through the markets? Tom talks a lot about the currency mechanism. You do see the renminbi at the weakest versus the dollar going back to November. When does it start to have a more contagion effect? We're breaking through. That's the first thing I looked at this morning was uh, dollar yuan. And the fact is uh, they're, they're moving. I mean, there's just no other way uh, to put it. To Bullard, you know, one of the great, great things this weekend was the giant Miguel Cabrera of the Detroit Tigers was at Fenway. You know, it's the end of the season, last time there. And 35,000 people stand up and applaud for like 10 minutes. I mean, his career. Do you wonder? I mean, Bullard, you know, the you only reason Jim. the only reason you, you the is only reason you, you go to see Bullard is to go to the Cardinals with him in the four seats that the St. Louis Fed has. Is he going to be there tonight at Cardinals A's? And they're going to stand up for 10 minutes and how many people Bullard? in that stadium do you reckon know? <laughs> Know who he is. Who he is. <laughs> I love busting Jim Bullard's chops about the time. Don't say that. People think we actually have box seats. Sebastian Page joins <clears> us now, <throat> head of global multi asset and CIO at T Rowe Price. Sebastian, you can be one of the five this morning. What's behind that bond market move? Higher inflation expectations. Look, we're all seeing inflation coming down. But when I look at my one-year break-evens this morning on my Bloomberg, I see 1.56%. To me, that is too low. If I think of the risk to inflation, it's not to the downside, it's to the upside. And Jonathan, you nail the reason. It's the commodities, oil prices being up quietly 20%. You need energy to produce goods and services. <clears throat> And I think sometimes we underestimate the impact on even core inflation of higher energy prices. So I'm not saying inflation's <clears throat> coming back to the levels we seen, you know, a year ago, a year and a half ago. But to me, I look at this and the risk is to the upside. And that's what the bond market, even right. in the long end, is starting to smell. Sebastian, and for radio, this is my most important chart right now. It's a Bloomberg total return chart. This is the all in soup to nuts uh, a chart as well. And, and the bottom line here is we're about ready to break down to new price weakness off the carnage of two or three uh, years ago. And I just, you know, I just don't know what to say here about price down. If we get the bond market to break down to lower prices, what does that do to equities? You know, it's always a risk to equities because you're revaluing. And year to date, equities have rallied on the price earnings ratio on the valuation. And that is sensitive to rates. And earnings are kind of soft, down 7% year over year. So it is a risk to equities, Tom. But one thing I want to say is, this is not the time to panic about duration. If anything, now you have a better entry point. You know, in our fixed income portfolios, we have added duration this year. It is a quote unquote, and I use quotation marks, hedge against a real growth shock. We know that the most anticipated recession in history is becoming the most delayed recession in history, but there's pressure building in the system. So here's what we're doing in our fixed income portfolios. We're not panicking about duration right now. I think we have duration and we're pairing it with credit. I call this the mar magic barbell, but I'm getting 9% total yield out of high yield. So I like my fixed income factors to be diversified. And now you get paid. You get paid for the protection of treasuries if you get a growth shock. It won't protect you for an inflation shock, which is kind of, we're not talking about an inflation shock, but inflation pressures, which is kind of what you're seeing now. But I think you have to step back and look at what's the, 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 the greater risk right now is, yeah, sell off in stocks. Okay, well, hold on a risk. second. Let me try to make sure that I understand this. You're saying that the risk with inflation is an upside surprise, that it could reaccelerate, and yet you're leaning into duration because it's not an inflation shock. It's just an inflation grind higher. What is the difference? So we're using duration as a hedge to a growth shock. We're not going fully overweight duration. To me, the risk to inflation is three, six months, it starts speaking back up. Uh, but at, at the end of the day, if you take a six to 18 month horizon, so Lisa, it's a difference in horizon here, you do want some hedges in your portfolio. And where do you get those hedges? Right now, you get them a little cheaper 
than uh, you have in the past. So it's nuanced, right? It's just diversifying the different risk factors. And one thing that you talked about was the commodities pressure to really fuel some of the reinflation. And this comes as we take a look at China and the potential threats there, uh, the risks to growth. If, let's say, there is a reversal in oil prices and that comes with a lot of weakness, how do you rearrange at a time where you're preferring high yield bonds over equities, where you're preferring sort of some barbell approach to really being a more conservative uh, kind of asset allocator right now? Yeah, you look at the spread for high yield, it's not particularly attractive, although if you adjust it for forecasted default risks, it's not bad, but I'm an asset allocator. I really care about the total yield. And Lisa, the comparison with the earnings yield is really advantageous, 80th, 90th percentile in favor of high yield bonds. I'm getting 9% out of high yield bonds globally, and the earnings yield is down to say 5% on stocks. That spread, right now is really advantageous. We're not forecasting a really hard landing uh, wave of defaults, even if things slow down in China, which they are. So on a relative basis, look, we always invested in stocks, but we're close to neutral right now, slightly underweight. Right. If we're going to add to the portfolio on the risk side, might as well do it with high yield. Sebastian, very quickly, your acclaimed book, which is, folks, I can't say enough about this effort by Sebastian Bay, a page, a really sophisticated effort. Do I want to be diversified or do I want to be more acutely focused right now? Look, I think diversification remains critically important when you're going through a regime shift, Tom, which is what we're going through. You've talked about this on the show. Gravity is back in financial markets. We have a ton of cash in the sidelines. So you don't want to go all the way to cash, right, and, and just miss the upside of stocks in the long run. I don't think you want to go all the way to stocks right now. And there are other opportunities. Look, Tom, let's just, let's just think about valuations. OK, the tech sector is trading at a price earnings ratio of 30. So let's say you missed the rally. Do you want to chase that momentum or maybe wait to buy the dip? You actually have a third option, which speaks to diversification, which is to get in parts of the markets that have really not participated. Quality small caps, price earnings ratio of 13. That's hard recession level. Uh, emerging market stocks, price earnings ratio at 11. We mentioned high yield bonds, yields at 9%. Um, you know, so the energy sector trading at, at 12 PE ratio. So there are ways to get in the market where uh, you're not just chasing the momentum. And I saw, I call this the third option. Either you chase the momentum, wait for the dip, or take a diversified approach to your question, Tom and get in parts of the market that haven't participated. Energy, EM, you know, very high yield, uh, upper, you know, higher yield in the high yield bond space. So there are opportunities to get in, Tom, and diversify. Sebastian, always enjoy your insights, sir. Good friend of this program. Sebastian Page there of T. Rowe Price. If you're just tuning into this program, welcome. Welcome to this program and good morning to you in the equity market. We're positive here by 0.2%. I can't think of two bigger stories in financial markets right now. The commodity market, one. The bond market, two. Sebastian Page connecting both. Your 10-year at 415, crude at 83, a 30 basis point move over the last three weeks on a 10-year yield, Lisa, and a big, big rally in crude off the lows from the middle of June. This has been the sleeper issue. I mean, honestly, I was driving around yesterday and I saw the price of gasoline and you have to start to realize, wait a second, we've reset back to places where people started to push back and get concerned. We're not talking about that anymore because of the resilience. But at what point does that really start to hamper consumer discretionary buying power? Does it also cause prices to go up at, at places? I'm thinking of airline tickets. I mean, people are talking about prices yeah, coming down. Can they continue to go down if you see oil prices <clears throat> yeah. where they are? Airline experts, George Ferguson, Bloomberg Intelligence, and others are saying, yes, jet fuel will fold into this uh, if we break out the $90 Brent crew. But I take your point. What I would suggest, not only here, but at Jackson Hole, if you get a continue to move up in gasoline, a gallon of gas, it's going to affect the dialogue of Jerome Powell. You think so? Yeah. Shifts that I've fast? Got to. Yeah. Upside risk to inflation? Do, even if it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. In Washington, a gallon of gas matters. Will he be on the same page as Sebastian <clears throat> Page? Doesn't have a choice. Perhaps unlikely at this point, given the disinflationary trends we've seen over the last couple of months. But there's a feeling, Lisa, that they embrace that a little bit in a week or so. I'm expecting to hear something a little bit more dovish. Patience, this idea of we need to see where we are. We're restrictive, sufficiently restrictive. 
all of these types of comments. Imagine if Jim Bianco was on the committee right now. <laughs> I think inflation's bottoming. It's going to accelerate. <laughs> He'd be raising here. hell. That'd change the conversation. Be kind of fun. From New York City, this is Bloomberg. I've told you many times, I said it again at the Iowa State Fair, Right. Uh, I, I had no right to overturn the election. Look, there's almost no idea more un-American than the idea that any one person could choose which votes to count for president of the United States. The American people know, as I heard from dozens of people at the yeah. Iowa State Fair, Chuck, uh, the American people know the presidency Our belongs to, the, to them, to them alone, yeah. and no one person has ever had that authority or ever should under our system. That was Mike Pence there, the Republican presidential candidate and former vice president on NBC, maintaining that President Trump asked him to help overturn the 2020 presidential election. Quite a week ahead for you on the economic side of things. Retail sales tomorrow morning, plenty of earnings. Home Depot in the next 24 hours. On to Wednesday, you'll hear from Target. On to Thursday, you'll hear from Walmart. Going through this morning, equity's doing OK. It's a grind higher on the S&P 500 after a couple of weeks of losses. <coughs> We're up here by 0.2% in the bond market Tom, yields have been higher over the last month or so. They're just about unchanged this morning at 4.14.83. On the bond market, we've been talking yield and price. I want to go to this chart. Lisa knows this chart. The Bloomberg Total Return Index. This aggregates in all the bills, the bonds, and in between the notes that are out there. And Lisa, it's just really simple. On price, back to 2001, we had this horrific bond bear market. And then we've had some stasis. And to me, the maximum stress lease is if we roll over and revisit the price lows on bonds. I don't think that's in the market right now. So there's a distinction between people looking at their 401ks, looking at their statements and saying, oh, my goodness, my bonds yet again are losing a lot of value versus what we just heard from Sebastian Page, which is yields are high. They look good. It's a great entry point. And that divergence, I think, is unclear in terms of flows. And something new back 20 years it was good to speak. Bloomberg speaking with Bill Gross here. I believe it was on Friday here about uh, some of the history of the great moderation and the great bond losses we've seen uh, recently. Speaking of an immoderate Capitol Hill, Henrietta Trace joins now, Economic Policy Research Director of Ada Partners, who was on fire last week. We had to drag her back here this morning to talk about exactly where we are. Henrietta, it's a broad statement. Is the debt debate now the same old, same old you've heard for years? Or is there something new about our worry of our debt? and our deficit. I had a really interesting conversation with some um, senior counsel on the Hill late last week that I would share with y'all. The conversation around the debt and a government shutdown and federal spending has obviously been with us for a couple of months now um, since the Republicans came into control of the House. And that's great. You, know, you want to see that conversation. But the tension that we see between a small faction of House Republicans and the moderate or sort of middle ground of the House caucus and certainly the Senate is so far apart that the dialogue on the Hill now is not about reducing federal spending as a way to get over this impasse that we're going to face at the end of September. It's about who can we impeach? Can we get money for the border? What do we need to do to draw attention to immigration? And it is a dialogue that is really markedly important for your exact question, because it's not about the debt. It's not about deficit right. spending. Um, it's about whatever they can get from a political perspective to score a win. If there are tea leaves out there, like something at a state fair, OK, fine, Iowa, name another state. Or if it's something like the vote in Ohio last week that we talked about last week, is there a point where the middle ground of the two parties put the extremes in their place and we move forward to some kind of true political discourse? You know, I don't think we're going to see that until we get into the general election and probably not if Donald Trump is at the top of the ticket on the Republican side. The opportunity for Democrats to stress the extremism of the right when it comes to abortion and the um, inability to move beyond it from the right during primary season means at least for the next six to eight months, we're going to be in these hyper partisan camps. Um, and the issue of abortion, as you suggest from Ohio last week is so telling. It moves not just Democratic voters to get out, but the pendulum swing that we see from Republican voters just for example, in Arizona is a four percentage point swing of the voter base 
from 2016 when they elected Trump to 2020 when they elected Biden and then the 2022 midterms. That is abortion. It has moved the needle so substantially that in tight margin states like Ohio, like, uh, excuse me, not Ohio, but Arizona, Pennsylvania, Georgia, Nevada, in those states, the margin is so razor thin, but the pendulum swing that you're suggesting as they turn from partisan politics towards the moderate center is really the tell. And that's where you see the shift from Republican voters, um, independent voters, 63 percent of whom or 70 even in some cases believe that abortion should be legalized. Um, this is a voter issue that has tremendous impact in red states and blue. Ohio would be a perfect example in Kansas last year. First debate, nine days away. Let's set the stage. Really? Who's on it? That's a great question. Um, I don't know that Trump's going to be on it. Uh, I think that based off of how he's treating these indictments, he clearly wants to be at center stage. So it looks to me a little bit like he should be there. Um, I would recommend if I was on his campaign not to go because his next closest competitor, Ron DeSantis, is the one to beat. Um, he's at about 15 percent in the polls, which makes him far and away the front runner of the sort of second tier candidates. Everybody else is locked in sort of those low single digits. So I would say to Trump, you know, stay home if you can avoid the spotlight. Let Ron DeSantis take the last couple of hits. The potential for the Gavin Newsom, Ron DeSantis debate in uh, November 8th to be canceled if this can't be pulled off is something that I think is really important to watch. Um, and Lisa, to the conversation we had last week, it really opens the door for a third, uh, another candidate that maybe is not in the race right now to jump in. And that's something a lot of people are looking for. When you talk about Trump being a, a conventional candidate, he is not, as we all know, and he probably uh, isn't listening to conventional advice at a time where he stopped by the Iowa State Fair, broke with convention pretty directly. He wasn't supposed to be there. And he did this to try to basically lambast his uh, opponent, uh, Ron DeSantis, and people applauded him and they booed Ron DeSantis. How long can this playbook work where people don't need Donald Trump to flip burgers and to hold babies and to go around and shake people's hands? He can just swoop in for about an hour and basically give a stump speech, fly off, and everybody says, we like that he's unconventional. It's a TV show and he's an expert at it. I mean, it makes for excellent television. The booing gets more stories than the actual candidates, whether that's Mike Pence, Chris Christie, or Ron DeSantis. I mean, it's it, the playbook works. I would say keep doing it. Does wrapping m m work, Henrietta? Does that help? <laughs> no, it does not. And I would like to see the polls that are uh, maybe not directed from the Internet. I would love to see that for him. Uh, I, I don't give a lot of credit, credence to that candidacy. Henry Trace, Henry, thank you. Doing pretty well in some of the polls. Vivek Ramaswamy, who did a fantastic rendition of Eminem <coughs> over the weekend at the yeah. Iowa State Fair. If you've missed that, please <laughs> Google search it. for that on YouTube or Google it, Bramo. Honestly, at what point is this going to be the new playbook? And this has been, right? The more you can sort of be a reality TV star, the more you say in the uh, public eye, and that's better. More press is better. Do we stay with that kind of that kind of narrative? And if that's the case, who can possibly well, go up against the expert in reality television? I asked this question last week, and I, I, didn't, I didn't mean to make light of it. It wasn't a joke is 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 the is the voting about the economy stupid or is it just simply going to be one big culture war debate i don't have an answer i'm just saying my evidence is day to day culture war is at least what sells cable tv time so i'd say one thing about that yeah. in the polls number one issue the economy the woke stuff the cultural stuff tom how's that worked out for the governor of florida who's rent really, really hard into yeah. that issue and hasn't yeah. gained traction. Well, is, is and what we've seen more recently from him is him start to lean in to the economics. So I think that speaks to right. where issues are at where, right where now. Where is this in Britain? I mean, Sunak and Labour and Starmer, <laughs> do they do have a culture war debate? No, yeah, they do they do. have a it's culture war everywhere. debate? It's happening everywhere. I don't know. You know. It's a Western yeah. phenomenon. Lisa said, is more press great for whoever candidate that might be? I would say right now, not all press is great. Some scathing articles going into the weekend on the Goldman Sachs CEO, David Solomon. I can tell you that at 8.15 Eastern time, so about 45 minutes from now, 50 minutes from now, we're going to catch up with my mayo of Wells Fargo. Tom, that conversation just around a corner on right. a guy 
that's really holding on at Goldman Sachs right now in the face of some very critical articles into the weekend. I'm always going to back Mike Mayo. This is a guy who has been summarily fired for security analysis independence. Mike Mayo is someone who speaks his mind fact-based. It'll be He's not just another conversation. This is the right guy at the right time in the future of that firm. That conversation in the next hour. Your equity market right now on the S&P 500, positive by 0.2% as we kick off a brand new trading week with equities pushing higher stateside. Good morning. Looking to bounce back this morning. Good morning to you in the equity market on the S&P 500. Equity futures positive by 0.2% on the Nasdaq, up by 0.3% on the month so far. In the last couple of weeks in August, the Nasdaq 100 down close to 5%. If we closed right here on track for the worst month of the year so far on the Nasdaq, just a bit of weakness creeping in to big tech and that heavy weighting on that benchmark. Into the bond market, yield tied by 30 basis points over the last three weeks. We haven't had a weekly decline in yields for more than a month on a 10-year, 414.64. The post-SVB failure high is about 420. So we're about five basis points away from that on the 10-year. If you want the pre-SVP multi-year highs, let's call it the cycle high, we were through 430, 433 intraday, 434, something like that back in October. So off those levels, but get in there, off the back of a big move in the commodity market. Elsewhere in foreign exchange, going into next month, I believe the 14th of September, the ECB decision, just around the corner. And then it's the then what? Then what? With the ECB, Lisa, do they hike? And then for the Federal Reserve, do they hike? And then... And what is the consequence if everyone is basically gamed out in ECB hiking rates more than the Federal Reserve at a time where the ECB is struggling with greater degrees of weakness while still persistent core inflation, especially in light of higher gas prices, natural gas prices? I mean, that's really going to become an issue for the ECB as well. Natural gas, crude, picking up in a big, big way. That currency pair, the euro, against the dollar, 109.40. Under surveillance this morning, China's country garden showing more signs of stress for the property market there. The developer is asking to stretch out a bond payment due on September 2nd over the next three years. Country Garden is yet to comment on Bloomberg's reporting, but an indication, Lisa, across a range of businesses now about mispayments, reworking the debt, and it focuses around one part of that economy, the property market. Which has a lot of tentacles, and we found this with also uh, that private wealth manager who is not able to make payments on all of their products. That was the other news that came to light, as you mentioned. How much do we see this continuing to percolate out and a task force. Is that sufficient? What does that mean? Is that it? That the f officials can just basically say, well, think about it and we're going to look at it. Can they come with some sort of stimulus package or are well, they done at a time where they can't or they don't want to reinflate the bubble? The Yang family have been doing this for 30 years and Mr. Yang Sr. has retired away. But a single sentence here, and this is from the vast compendium of Wikipedia. After his resignation, Yang Guoqing kept the role of special advisor to the Cayman Island Registered Company. This is not just a Chinese story. Like Alibaba and the rest, this is a westernization of their finance under their rules using institutions in the Cayman Islands, among you know, other things. And that's why our radar, that's why our scrutiny needs to be in place, John. It's Elisa's point. We don't know how far these tentacles stretch out, Tom, and what they touch. Or what but it all they goes touch. back to one yeah. thing. It's yeah. the the property market right now. And we seem to be talking about it every single day at the moment. Another story for you, Goldman Sachs, now expecting the Fed to cut rates in Q2 <coughs> of next year. Jan Hatzius and the team writing, quote, the cuts in our forecast are driven by the desire to normalise the funds rate from a restricted level. Once inflation is closer to target, we are penciling in 25 basis points of cuts per quarter, but we're uncertain about the pace. What is it about Q2 of 24? Because Mike Gapen over at Bank of America, he's right. pushed out his rate hike call from September to November. And he also sees these cuts starting, guess when, Tom? In Q2, yeah. 2024. When Dr. Hatsi is careful with his language here and penciling is the key phrase there. That's not a lot of conviction. I mean, penciling in, out, out, out. And there's a lot of this, that. Guess what? I would suggest every market economist and strategist is as data dependent as any given governor or president or exiting Bullard, for that matter. John Williams of Pencil. the New York Fed 
penciled something into the New York <clears throat> Times a week ago, yes. a week today. And his point was very intuitive, and we've talked about it lots. The concept is as follows. Basically, inflation is going to come down, nominal rates stay steady. That means real rates increase. Lisa, to make sure that real rates are consistent and don't become more restrictive, they have to reduce interest rates. And perhaps that sequence of things starts taking place last, next year. But given how things have gone this year, can you make a call like nine months out from now? I can't. This I've got is, no idea. This is the reason why I actually care less about when they start cutting rates. And I was actually more interested in what Jan Hatia said about where the Fed funds rate would stabilize. And he said three to three and a quarter percent. That's where he sees a stabilization for the new Fed rate. That's what I want to hear from Jackson Hole. Are they starting to game out what the new neutral is at a time when there is more uh, momentum and there's more uh, strength in this economy than people had expected? A new floor. Mike Gapin talking about the same thing. At BFA, we're on the same page. Three is untenable. I don't, I don't politically. I don't think they can. They can do, take it in below any three. way. Do a run rate of three. They gotta jawbone it under three. I, I just. I can't frame out an American central bank of three or above. Those conversations it's about a week away. Final story <coughs> for you. The billionaire battle between Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg uh, may not be go. happening after all. The Meta CEO, Zuckerberg, took to threads over the weekend to say threads. this. He's really so taken a high ground on this issue. <laughs> if Elon ever gets serious about a real date and official event, he knows how to reach me. Otherwise, time to move on. I'm going to focus on competing with people who take the sport seriously. Last week, Musk posted on X formerly known as Twitter, that a fight was happening, but he might require surgery for an issue with his right shoulder. Then he talked about it taking place in, was it Rome, Italy? Yeah, yeah, he's gladiator. To the prime minister. He's going to go full gladiator. <laughs> Honestly, I mean, at one point, yes, he's being the adult in the room, Mark Zuckerberg. On the other hand, the fact that we're talking about no. this seriously no. is so absurd. And that, you know, I mean, honestly, we can't tell. Is it fact? Is it fiction? You get the sense that Elon Musk has been trolling Mark Zuckerberg, and Mark Zuckerberg is sick of it. He's just I, like, I, I don't want to be trolled anymore. I, I wish the two would just trot out. And frankly, I'm a Mr. Zuckerberg's, I like his tone on this at least. But two fancy people like that, you know, you go, okay, we're going to go to the Coliseum or whatever in Rome. We're going to do this no. Billy Jean some money King for charity. extravaganza. And we're also going to fund the high school educations of 10,000 Rome kids or something. Make it applied charity. That would change the dialogue. I'm with you. That would be very cool. <clears throat> that would be very cool. Right now, we're going to get a clinic. This is really important. It is federated, Hermes, and the answer with federated is all of the heritage of the firm that has owned the money market acclaim. Reserve Fund was the first one out there. They get the history book, but it's really federated, who in 1969 said you could own a portfolio of government securities. In 1976 said you could own a money market fund and make more yield. And that gets us out to where we are next year. Deborah Cunningham is global liquidity market CIO and historian at Federated Hermes Pittsburgh. Uh, Deborah, honored to have you on today as well. Is it a new era for money market funds? Well, I do think um, to some degree we're out of the zero rate environment <laughs> that we have been in for, call it, 12 of the last 14 years. So in that sense, Tom, yes, it's a new era. Um, I don't think we get to the point where we are in double digits, anything like that, nor do I feel like we go back to anything that's um, a zero or single, uh, you know, zero, zero rate or one one percent type of environment. I, I agree to some to some uh, sense with the three percent, three and a quarter percent, three and a half percent terminal um, Fed funds target range. That gives you a two plus percent inflationary rate. Plus, you have, call it 100 basis points for risk out the curve to a year. Um, and I think you get to something that then gives you a normalized <laughs> rate right. for savers and for um, for those who are are, are, right. are taking out loans and paying rates on their, their cash. Federated owns a high ground on this. Not so much what money market funds will do. Do you just assume over the coming quarters that the rest of the banking finance establishment catches up to where they should fit in X number of basis points below some high-yielding money market fund that only John Farrell's brave enough to go into? Well, you know, those really aren't money market funds if they're all that high yielding and, and you need bravery to go into it. There are some new products out there from banks that are what I'll call brokered CDs, for lack of a better term, <laughs> um, that 
necessarily are not providing the same type of safety, <laughs> diversification, and quality that you get in a money market fund. These are highly regulated uh, types of vehicles, saving vehicles and cash vehicles. And as such, you, you know, the, the, the bank's true CDs are not catching up to those interest rates that are in the market today. You know, they have to maintain their net interest margin from yeah. a banking financial institution standpoint, but they are coming up with other products. Lisa, I can't convey enough the snarkiness of Deborah Cunning there, Deborah Cunningham <laughs> being a total class act, tearing to shreds brokered CDs, which are basically a marketing campaign to bring in a lot of money by, by finding a number of beeps above ground. You don't need to have a marketing campaign though, if you have three and a half percent terminal Fed funds rate. And Deborah, this is to your point. How much does cash become a greater staple in people's portfolio if it is income producing, whether it is corporations or whether it's asset allocators at a time where there is a lot of uncertainty? In other words, how much is this not cash in the sidelines? It's just cash and it's going to stay cash. You know, Lisa, I think that that is where we were prior to 2007. And then the great financial crisis changed. Um, the interest rate environment changed for a very long period of time. But I think we get back to where we were. And it is be it, it, it does become a larger allocation. It does become a larger asset class to the tune of not five to seven percent, but maybe 15 to 20 percent. And as such, um, you know, there's a lot of room for industry growth with 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 securities in the market, as well as the demand for the product at this point and what I think going forward. Deborah, thank you. Deborah Cunningham there of Federated Hermes. Tom, how many times have you said it so far this year? <coughs> Gravity's back. Good. No, I, I stole it from back. Nassim Taleb. Let, let's be clear here that within the equation of derivatives, of which Dr. Taleb is is expert on, uh, and someone like Bruno De Pere at Bloomberg is 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 well. The gravity is there, and it's called a real rate. You can bring it over to equities in a sharp ratio where you've got a risk-free rate, but the answer is the gravity's back. And yields are up, and you can get some yield. And cash is back. It's well, no longer let, trash and all that good stuff. For how long? If you believe the rate cutting cycle begins next year, is it time to start locking it in, Lisa? That. Well, I mean, and then do you start to see that rally in the back end start yeah. to reassert itself because of that? But what she just said there, what Deborah Cunningham said, 15 to 20 percent of your portfolio could be in cash. This is at a time where you're already seeing money market assets in the U.S. climb to record highs of five and a half trillion dollars. If you've got gravity, where is it coming out of? How permanent is some of these asset this classes really that completely deflated because suddenly everything's parked <clears throat> in cash? We, we are hardwired on an income statement analysis. In the old world, uh, Britain and Europe looks at a balance sheet dynamic. So if you have money market funds go from 5.1%, 5.2% with a 3% run rate that Hotsius is talking about, you get out to 6 7% money market fund. Nobody's framing that right now. And that means, John, on a balance sheet basis, yield up priced down. Is that how it works? That's how it works. Price and the answer is, does that, Wait, fold, into, I'm not following. Does that Bramo fold into wants, disinflation? Does that fold into another round. No, yeah. I think it's really, really, no one's uh, framing this out. What about down. the future? It won't be the same <clears throat> as the past. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you. No, I, I think no one's framing this out and it folds into the inflation debate as well. Yeah, if you're just tuning in, welcome. <laughs> Took us a while to get going this morning. Welcome to the program on the S&P 500, positive here by 0.15%. Coming up very shortly, Pooja Siriam of Barclays at about 8.30 Eastern time. We'll have that conversation in about 45 minutes from now. I would say don't miss this in about 30 minutes to catch up with us on Goldman Sachs. Mike Mayo of Wells. And you'd have to say someone's having a difficult time over at Goldman Sachs, Tom, in a big seat, the CEO. David Solomon. Let's move beyond the conventional security analysis, management discussion, and that. A lot of it's been whispered. A lot of it's been alluded to. John, I think in the interviews you and I have done with Mr. Solomon, you know, we've had to talk about his new style, which is very much in all the different articles of the last three or four days. Someone like Mayo is looking at performance, and I guess what's keeping Mr. Solomon at peace is there's been pretty good stock performance. There's been pretty good performance away from the consumer bank disaster. So... It'll be interesting to see how Mike folds pro-securities analysis into the emotion that Lisa was talking about. I mentioned this with Jared Cassidy last week. I don't know David personally. We've had those interactions and interviews that we've broadcast here on Bloomberg. He's also a decent guy, always a decent guy to deal with when we had those interactions, Tom. But I think we said last week with Jared, there's something about this that feels very, very personal within 
the bank within the institution, Lisa. And that's backed up by the commentary we saw in another article, this time in New York Magazine, going into the weekend. People just saying they don't like dealing with him, that when he walks into people's offices, they get scared. And this is sort of a real concern. At what point does that become an issue if the earnings performance isn't there? Mike Mayo of Wells Fargo, 30 minutes away. Keith Lerner of Truist, just around the corner from New York. This is Bloomberg. China stimulus narrative is one that the markets have really loved and embraced, and we're getting a bit of a reality check on that. As it relates to commodity prices, all of this news of stimulus has certainly pushed them up, pushed inflation expectations higher, and that's become a big problem for the Fed here, who certainly has not yet claimed victory uh, on inflation. That was the brilliant Emily Rowland there, the co-chief investment strategist over at John Hancock. Goldman Sachs, they're looking for a rate cut maybe as early as next year. Let's see. Let's see about that. Will we get stimulus from the likes of China? JP Morgan, Miss Life Matekas, pushed back all year against this. He says this this morning. We stay unexcited by China exposure despite periodic bounces on the back of Stimulus Hopes news. Continue fading these. It's EK, that's been the pushback from JP Morgan and the investment bank. They've had a difficult year calling the US equity market. I'd say they've been pretty decent when it comes to calling China and what's developed, or rather what hasn't developed on the stimulus front over the last couple of months. Well, the stimulus front's there, and like you say, it's what has not occurred here. And the answer is, do you have Beijing-like stimulus? And the real question is, within the formulas, does it distribute out to the cities? And I wonder, what's different now is Xi and the dictatorship, the party congresses, the method of politics here. Within the new G politics, can you distribute stimulus? That's unproven. Things aren't great there right now. Tesla <clears throat> making a call to cut prices. Let's have a look at the stock this morning in the pre-market for Tesla. Cutting prices once again in China on the Model X by roughly $1,900 on two versions of it. The stock is down by 2.5%. Lisa sales in China. I saw deliveries for the month of July slump something like 30 plus percent in July, and here are the price cuts all over again. So it raises a question of whether this is a China issue, whether this is just a Tesla competitive issue, or they're trying to gain traction against Geely and some of the other local uh, EV manufacturers, or is this a broader story? And we see this not just with Tesla, but other industrial companies in the US that are downgrading their sales picture for China because they don't see the demand there. Tom Tesla down by more than 2%. There it morning. is, and what's the future of it? I mean, John, to me, it's just more about China than, than, than anything. The way I'd take this, and this is our conversations with Generous Motors and Ford as well. Craig Trudell joins us from Detroit to talk here about the knock-on. Craig, just as a beginning question, is there a knock-on effect from Tesla China to what, say, the Ford F-150 EV Super Crew, Lisa's looking at this truck, at $98,000. I mean, can you take a price cut in China and bring it to a price cut of a $98,000 pickup in America? I think what we're seeing absolutely and have been seeing, you know, really since uh, late last year is this case of an industry that has been extremely production constrained, swinging to, you know, actually having the ability to make as many cars as it wants to again, and maybe even making more than it has demand for. And so that's why we're seeing price pressure across the board and across markets. So you're seeing Ford bringing down the F-150 Lightning uh, pricing in the U.S., uh, Tesla bringing down prices globally. I think what we're also seeing specifically with the Model Y, the, the subject of today's uh, price cut in, in China, is, is that it's a, a sort of a complicated story of a, a rare EV that is selling in extremely high volumes and doing so at, at strong pricing for, <clears throat> for quite some time. They were only going to be able to sustain that for so long. If you want to sell in the sorts of volumes that uh, that Tesla was was sort of you know getting investors uh, used right. to, uh, that price point, there's only so much demand there. You're in the United Kingdom, the land of Airfl Al Alfred Marshall. Is there price elasticity? Is there responsiveness? If they cut price, Tesla or Ford, do we respond? Yeah, I think one of the, the key sort of things that everybody's waiting on here is Tesla, you know, updating their lineup a bit. They, they really have two horses to this lineup, the Model Y and the Model 3, and uh, a lot of expectations of some, some, you know, refreshes of those products in, in the coming months. 
if they're able to sort of, you know, spruce up the lineup up, line up, up a bit, will that help them sustain pricing and, and, you know, sort of, you know, put an end to this, you know, week after week, month after month, you know, gradual come down in pricing across some of their major markets? We saw a little bit of a pause in that the last uh, couple of months. But, you know, sort of beneath the surface, they were still doing some tweaks, you know, whether it was, you know, messing with inventory models or what, what have you. Uh, they, they are sort of steadily bringing pricing down as a result of the fact that, you know, they brought on so much capacity so fast. We're seeing a lot of the industry do that, right, uh, try to increase volume. And as they do that, they're going to have to adjust prices down. So, Craig, we're identifying three different issues here. One is Tesla. Two is the broader EV market. Three is China. Craig, can you tell me specifically what is happening <coughs> in China on the demand side? It's, it's a, uh, both a story of, of actually strong demand and yet, uh, you know, real competitive pressures, right? So you have an extremely crowded market. Uh, you have uh, issues with uh, the, the fact that, you know, BYD and a lot of other Chinese manufacturers ha have really become competitive in a dramatic way and really sort of squeezed out uh, some of the international players. And we've seen that whether it's Tesla, whether it's Ford, whether it's General Motors, Volkswagen, a lot of international companies are, are really struggling in China in a way that they haven't in the past. I think one other thing to keep in mind here, we mentioned the, the decline in shipments for Tesla in China uh, last month. Some of that had to do with the fact that they were doing some factory upgrades globally, and that may have to do with you know changing over the, the plants to make these updated models. So that might actually end up being a little bit of a, a blip. They also tend to you know, bring production down at the beginning of, of the month, uh, at least for, for local deliveries, and sort of you know, back end their, their quarters. So we may see you know, some incremental improvement uh, this month and next month for Tesla in China. Craig, I, I'd love you to build on what you were just saying. It, it, is China right now pushing out U.S. auto manufacturers even more than they were, say, a year ago, saying that they have electric vehicle manufacturers and really placing emphasis on them? In other words, there's plenty of demand, just not for anything made in the U.S. or by U.S. companies. Yeah, I, I think it's really interesting because in the past it was always kind of talked about as, you know, something that was maybe a little bit conspiratorial. You know, there, there was this model for, for a long time in China of you had to set up local joint ventures with local players and, and sort of help this uh, domestic industry, you know, learn and, and evolve. And that was, you know, really beneficial both to the local companies and to the international car makers uh, that, you know, made China the, the biggest market uh, in, in the world. Uh, you know, for companies like, you know, Mercedes, General Motors, Volkswagen, uh, we're now seeing a, a real challenge of, of sort of being able to sustain that presence in China, particularly as we've switched from combustion engines to EVs. We've seen, you know, ch the Chinese be able to sort of drive price down in a dramatic way of, of batteries and innovate in, in really impressive ways. And you see companies like BYD, you know, bring out fresh models, you know, month after month, Whereas Tesla, you know, really has emphasized, you know, just a couple of horses, as I mentioned, of the Model 3 and Model Y. They're, you know, doing, you know, more than 90 percent of their volume of just those two models, and they haven't updated them in years. Craig, we've got about 60 seconds left. We can squeeze in some controversy. When do you think we'll all stop pretending that all of this stuff is good for the environment? <laughs> oh, man, we, that's going to be a tough one to sum up in 60 seconds. <laughs> I do think it's absolutely uh, something that, you know, the industry is talking about specifically as it comes to, you know, policymakers and, and the IRA and, and the countries trying to match IRA. They are going to play that card of, wait, how clean uh, are these EVs being made in China? John, do you see how the kid from Michigan State, he goes over to London to do global cars for us. He's that large. And he's popping from Lansing, East Lansing, Michigan, Michigan State, <laughs> over to Mayfair. I mean, Craig Trudell, he just looks Mayfair, doesn't he? That's a better way to cover Detroit, isn't it? From I Mayfair. I think so. <laughs> Looking out to Detroit. You know, yeah, you know, I think he's all over it. I More mean, controversy just, there. Very, Craig, I expect yeah, exactly. the right before to you get into trouble. Moment. Craig there, Craig Trudell there <laughs> of Bloomberg. Don't we just, I know we keep coming back to this, and some people have done some phenomenal work on how the marketing around automobiles have been highly manipulative to put themselves at one with the environment. And we do it so much more now. We use EV and green in the same sentence all the time. What's green about? How many tons do these cars weigh, yeah. Tom? What's green about this? Especially this because weekend, uh, they are, you know, trucks and they're coming in and the mining for the materials that go into it 
requires a lot of an environmental footprint, and it's unclear whether by the time they've already mined it, are they going to be recycling it, like they say, or will they be onto a new technology? That's I read carefully greener. an article this weekend, John. You nailed it. The weight of the automobiles. Everybody wants a big Ford F one fifty, and that's not as green as the little itty bitty thing driving around. You get a small internal combustion engine and probably better for the environment. Mike Mayo, 20 minutes away from Wells Fargo, from New York City. This is Bloomberg. We're getting a couple months of softer inflation readings here. That's certainly going to look like a soft landing. I don't think that's where we're headed. We've got to price in either lower inflation or lower growth. Our expectation is that the economy will begin to slow and therefore you'll see demand kind of slipping off again. We would be mindful of taking too much risk in this environment. We will see a more dovish tone coming from the policymakers. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Brown, and Tom Keen. Deep into August, we are on radio, on television. A lot going on in the market. So, John, we mentioned this in the 6 o'clock hour. Guess what? August. Complex. Retail this week. That's the headline <clears throat> for you. This year so far, this economy is surprised to the upside in a major way. This consumer has been so much more resilient than people thought it would be. Retail sales tomorrow morning, first test for this month. Then on to retail earnings later on this week with Walmart on Thursday, Target on Wednesday. Tom, all of that into Jackson Hole. How much can this consumer stand the pain of higher interest rates? When do we start to see that bite in a more material way as we go deeper, not just through this summer, but deeper through 2023? Not only the retail story and again, to, uh, to me i think walmart's the most fascinating to me I, you know we had uh, joe felbin on from telsey advisory group on the nuances of big box but i'm just as interested in the nuances globally of the consumer and i can't judge where the chinese consumer is right now john i think it's truly a mystery i think we can confidence hammered and not <clears throat> recovering and the property market's not recovering either it's just property problem markets after problem. where we look yeah problem after problem just bubbling to the surface tom at the moment we're not seeing that bleed out beyond china into international markets in quite the same way we would have done maybe eight years ago we said repeatedly that on mornings like this one right. where you'd see concern around property developers wealth managers you'd see a bond market rallying commodities selling off concerns <clears> about <throat> chinese growth you're seeing quite the opposite you're seeing yields higher over the last right. three weeks crude rallying over the last couple of months. And they're the two issues right now that I think a lot of people are focused on this week. Right now, John, August, back to school reading. And Lisa and I know growing up in America, you read Steinbeck, written in 1961 at gunpoint. You had to read The Winter of Our Discontent, like sometimes even twice through your school years. At least it's the summer of our discontents. There's a whole plural plurality of issues here across equities, bonds, currencies, commodities. I don't know how someone like Jan Hatzius can look out to Q2 2024, there's too many discontents. It's the reason why I find it fascinating <clears throat> this week we're focused on both retail sales and the U.S. consumer and the divergence from the macro story more globally with China. This, there's a real tension there, right, which is the resilience of people in the U.S. continuing to spend the divergence of the U.S. economy from China and weakness <clears throat> percolating elsewhere that hasn't really played into substantially weaker oil prices. Right. Yeah, a little lower today, but not a significant sell-off after a seven-straight-week rally in this commodity. That's the Bloomberg surveillance conversation. I would suggest in America, in the United Kingdom, you've got an entire group of society that is feeling they're in a recession. John John Bern Murdoch at the FT last week with that United Kingdom thing of here's the prosperity of London and here's everybody else. You can bring that right over to substantial parts of America. Barron's the journal, the FT, Bloomberg. <coughs> I think everyone's done phenomenal work on this. Economists are focused on price level change. So they're looking at very high prices starting to stabilize and starting to identify what they would call disinflation. Consumers aren't seeing that. They don't feel that. They just see high prices yeah. and high prices. And maybe they're not getting higher, but prices are still high. That's the difference between a I consumer's attitude agree. to prices and yeah. economists. Economists look to the price level change. Consumers are just looking at this like, this is really expensive and wasn't this expensive a couple of years ago. Goofy day here. Equities mid-range, 15.61 on the VIX. John, I'm going to go to the foreign exchange market. I have a yen, dollar yen, weaker yen. Printing a 145, it's not 147, it's not 150, but it gathers my attention. Equities right now just about positive by 0.1% on the S&P 500. <laughs> Yield shaping up as follows. Just bleeding a little bit higher again now at the front end by a basis point. 490 on a two-year, 
on a 10-year upper basis point time, 4.16. Getting closer and closer to that post-SVB failure high of about 4.20 on a 10-year yield. Get out your log paper and your ruler now. This is a joy. He's Chief Market Strategist, Truest Advisory Services, and the Keith Leonard charm is not only fundamental analysis, but also folding in technical analysis. He was something at Schwab uh, years ago in their technical side. Keith Lerner, technically, are we in the second leg of a bull market? Well, first, uh, great to be with you um, for this, this stellar group this morning. Uh, to answer your question, I mean, I, I do think you have to give the, the, the weight of the evidence that the trend is still intact for the, for the bull market. But our view, and really our call coming into um, August, was that we're gonna, we were going to consolidate, right? Uh, Jonathan mentioned earlier, you know, why this market has done so well. The economy surprised to the upside, earnings surprised to the upside, inflation surprised to the upside. But what you've seen more recently uh, is that during the earnings season, instead of going up on positive earnings, stocks actually went down. We had a good inflation print uh, last week, and the markets really didn't do much on that. So I think we're in this consolidation zone. Expectations have been right. set high, and I think we just need to, to move sideways for a bit. Keith, you and I learned point and figure charts from the great Louise Yamada. She would talk about distribution. Isn't boredom, isn't range bound, isn't distribution healthy to have a continued up market? I think part of that is healthy. I mean, you know, what we saw even coming um, after July is that we've seen sentiment reset higher and expectations reset higher. So what have we seen in the last few uh, weeks here? We've seen the market kind of pull back modestly and we're seeing sentiment get more cautious uh, already. So I think that's ultimately a positive sign. And I don't think the individual investor ever got to euphoria. If you look at the fund flows from the ICI data for this year, we've seen um, equity flows relatively flat. We've actually seen $100 billion go into the, uh, the fixed income side. So, and the last thing, Tom, to your point, it's normally two steps forward, one step back. I think at minimum, we have at least a baby step back and some more choppy action here near term. There is a question, though, going forward, if we do see a Fed funds rate, terminal Fed funds rate, of about 3 to 3.5%, three as a number of different strategists have been gaving out, what that does to cash allocations, what that does to being more conservative on a more permanent basis. Is that something that you're hearing from your clients and recommending Deborah Cunningham's 15 to 20% in cash or cash-like instruments that we were just talking about earlier today? Well, I do think cash has a place in a portfolio. Obviously, at 5%, I think that's much more attractive than we've seen. Now, I will say, if you go back to the, the mid-90s, the stock market still did well, even when cash rates were relatively high. So I think the good news for investors, which is a lot different in the last decade, is you don't have to take all the risk by just being in the equity market. You can look at the bond market, you can look at um, money markets, and you have a, a better balanced portfolio with offsets. Before this, you know, it was a really hard time. We had a lot of investors that we were dealing with that were taking on too much equity risk because there was no alternative. So I think, you know, fundamentally, this is a positive for, for investors. When people take a look at equities, I've heard a number of people saying they're looking more at commodities, at banks, at some of the areas that haven't really gotten as much love this year. Are you in that camp that now is a time to buy energy stocks, especially in light of the rally, despite some of the concerns over in China? Yeah, we actually um, more recently upgraded energy. Uh, you know, we do think there's more upside there. If you think about energy the last few years, it had a uh, you know, big year uh, last year. This year, it's only up about 2%. We've seen those production cuts um, on oil, and we've seen oil prices rebound quite a bit. They're still very cheap, gener generating a lot of cash flow. So we do think there's more rotation there. The challenge for the overall headline market, it's only about 4.5% of the index level. So what we're seeing here short term, which likely is to continue, is money coming out of tech and moving to other areas like energy, financials. And one area we continue to like is the average stock or the equal weighted S&P index, which is a little bit less top heavy. Keith, what happens to the equity world if bond prices break down? If we do get, even if it's ever so slightly, we break support on price on bonds, we get lower price, higher yields. What does that do to the stock market? Well, I think we're already seeing that as we moved above 4% for the market, it, it put a, a cap on it. Uh, if you think about the S&P forward multiple, we're above, uh, we were at 19.6. We've pulled back to just below 19. But if you continue to move up on the four, uh, above, uh, you know, 425, I think it really puts a cap on how much higher expansion you can get and probably you actually start to see some compression. If you look at another way of looking at this is the equity risk premium, right? The, the equity yield relative to the bond yield, that's at the lowest level in about a decade. So I think that just constrains the upside the more that we see yields move higher here. And I think for the market to do well, you need them to at least stop moving up.
We were talking about China earlier, and I'm curious from your vantage point, how closely you're watching that story as we do hear about missed bond payments, the possible extension over at a major property developer or a financial services firm not being able to make payments. Do you care? How long can the U.S. economy remain divorced from what's going on over there? Well, we do care. I mean, from an asset allocation perspective, we've been very negative on China. And that's one of the reasons why we've been basically zero uh, allocation in our global portfolios to EM since last year. And I, I think the main thing is it's just, you know, the, the, you talk about the stimulus and you had this big rally of, of hope and you've given all that back. And one of the things outside of all this that we pay attention to is the earning trends. How are those earning trends in China looking relative to the U.S.? And they're making new lows every week. And they've been doing this for over the past year. So from our perspective, it's a negative as far as for emerging markets because it's about a third of that index. And then more specifically to your question, I mean, it does, it, you know, a, 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 a big part of the deflationary story was China. So it will have some impact on, on the U.S. and keeping inflation probably higher for longer. The data has been really difficult over there, that's for sure. Keith, got to catch up as always. Keith Lerner there of Truist Advisory Services. Talked a lot about some of the scathing pieces we've seen in the press on Goldman Sachs and its leadership under David Solomon. More scathing pieces going into the weekend. Within one of those pieces from New York Magazine, the likes of Mike Mayo cited over at Wells Fargo. <clears throat> Let me share the quote with you. I've called for CEOs to be fired before. If it's warranted, I'll speak up, but I'm not seeing it from the outside metrics. Mike Mayo, Tom, on a difficult week for David Solomon again over at Goldman Sachs. He's going to join us shortly in about five minutes. I'm going to link Mike Mayo and the financial analysis that he's claimed for in there. He sees a constructive view on Goldman with William Cohen in his book, Money and Power. I get thrown at every kid that says, I want to work at Goldman or, you know, whatever. And the answer is there is a cultural fabric to William Cohen's book that's completely removed from what we saw in a set of articles this weekend. Well, this goes to what Gerard Cassidy was saying, right? I mean, is Goldman Sachs' performance that bad or is it just that people don't like David Solomon? I mean, these are the two distinctions here. And are we looking at a piece where people are saying they just don't like him? It has not as much to do with the performance of the actual company. On reading that piece, it feels deeply deeply personal. And we can talk to Mike Mayo about it in about five minutes' time. Looking forward to that. If you are just tuning in, welcome to the programme. Equity futures right now on the S&P 500. Just about positive, but rolling over. We're positive here by 0.1%. Talked a lot about the week ahead. Retail sales tomorrow morning. We're going to hear from Walmart on Thursday, Target on Wednesday. I believe we have some Fed minutes in the mix as well, Bramo. Wednesday. Wednesday. Yeah. That's going to be the mix too. Off the back of the Fed speak of the last couple of weeks, Tom. Feels like for many, we're at some kind of inflection point with Fed policy. Who gets the stage <coughs> in the minutes? The Hawks or the Duffs? If UADA shows up at Jackson Hole, is Jerome Powell, central banker of the world. Stephen Gallo, moments ago, publishing uh, Bank of Montreal, BMO Capital Markets, and it is a detailed note on the persistency of interventions, what it means for the Bank of Japan, what does it mean for Ministry of Finance, Frankly, what's it mean for the Fed? You think they start note. intervening in the FX market? What's Stephen saying? We're at 145, and we've broken through this morning to 145.20, and he's just saying it's not only the parlor game of will they intervene and what's it mean, can I trade, can I hold overnight, but every time you intervene, you lose a little bit of firepower. You lose. That's a classic Dornbush analysis. You lose a little bit of oomph every time you If they want in. a stronger currency, they can do something about it with <clears throat> rates, can't they? Start they can do it on the, the other side of the rates, absolutely. You know, Intervention's not just the, the only... They could do the unthinkable Lisa and, yeah. and hike rates next year. What I find interesting, how much of the move in the bond space is just directly uh, tied to the Bank of Japan? And this is something people are talking about, that even just the suggestion, the whiff of moving away from yield curve control has unanchored or perhaps just loosened a little bit of the anchor for global bond yields. There were two anchors around the neck of the global bond market. The bond market, driven by the ECB, anchors away. The BOJ slowly coming back up. I'm with you. I'm with you. And again, if you ask five different people what's <coughs> behind this move, five different reasons. Yield curve confusion is one. Commodity market is another. Treasury supply. Yeah. Data, the resilience of the U.S. economy. Take and, your pick. And then people will say, I just reject it. It's just technical. It's just wrong. It's just technical. When exactly. you disagree with all of the above, it's technical. <laughs> I don't think it can be sustained. 
Uh, you look at two percent real yields. We when we, we have, you've got to go back 15 years to see them being reasonably sustainable to before the global financial crisis. You look at this four percent U.S. GDP now cast we've got. You've got to go back, you know, 20 years outside of the pandemic. So I, I, I think this is pretty much the top, um, and, and I'd absolutely I, I'd absolutely be leaning leaning against this. That was Ben Laidler, global market strategist at eToro, who's been constructive over the years on this equity market. So that's the context for those particular comments this morning. Let's look at the equity market together in the S&P 500 at the moment. Futures are just about positive by 0.1%. Yields have been climbing now for the last several weeks. We've talked about the move over the last month of about 30 basis points higher. This morning up by a basis point, 416.59. Just some interesting levels to watch for you. Since the failure of SVB, we came very close to breaching 420 and staying there. And then we backed away. So that's the post sort of SVB high. Yeah. The pre-SVB failure high in the bond market, in this cycle at least, was back in October, north of 430. Oh. It's just interesting, Tom. We're going back there. Just <clears throat> yields, yeah. just climbing, commodities, yeah. rallying. This is two pieces of a focal point, I would say, for this for this market at the moment. And on a Monday, it's moving in real time, John. I just noticed moments ago a nice pop-up in the real yield, the 10-year real yield. We may print a 1.80%, and I think that would be of note, not only to bond participants, but the economics racket as well. We need to talk no, about Goldman Sachs, Tom. Some scathing, <clears throat> scathing articles going into the weekend, including this one from New York Magazine, shared by pretty much... Everyone I'm yeah. friends with, Tom, yeah. I got that in yeah. my inbox multiple times from multiple different people. The lead paragraph is pretty bruising. The headline is something I haven't right. read before about a banking CEO, at least in the last 10 years, Tom. Is David Solomon too big a jerk to run Goldman Sachs? Yeah, Lisa, John, and I really talked about this Friday about how to handle this, and we're going to handle it the way we've handled it for years. We're going to talk to experts. I spoke to our Sri Natarajan multiple times through the weekend, went back and forth with him this morning, and he will report on this along with our New York finance team. We welcome all of Global uh, Wall Street. In 1999, Mike Mayo got his butt fired in a major bank. It was a testament to all of us in the racket about independent securities analysis. The culmination of that was the Forrestal Award. John, it's the number one award at the CFA. And I can't tell you in 2013, the symbolism of Mike Mayo fired one evening for being independent, winning the top award at the CFA on ethics. This is a guy to speak to, uh, Mr. Solomon. The star analyst at Wells Fargo now, Mike Mayo, joins us. Mike, wonderful to catch up with you, sir. Let's talk about this story and the criticism around the Goldman Sachs leader. Do you get the sense this is strategic or deeply personal? Well, uh, thanks for having me on, and thanks for bringing up the CFA, which is the preeminent accreditation for a financial analyst. And I actually go back to those roots to think, how should I approach the situation about the CEO of Goldman Sachs and the, you know, the differentiation between the external metrics, which are good, and potential internal metrics, which might not be so good. The issue here is uh, I'm not seeing these metrics. I don't have these internal metrics. The company said they've not had any unusual turnover in the, the partner ranks um, relative by the numbers. So I'd say, look, what it comes down to is winning cures all. Goldman's had recent performance issues. They've missed expectations two of the last three quarters. And when that happens, other issues move more to the fore. And if I were to summarize the three issues, it'd be the three C's. One is the consumer expansion. That was a debacle. Second is the cultural change. David Solomon running Goldman more like a public company, you know, almost 25 years after they went public. And the third would be his character and you know, some attacks in the press on that character. So I'll go wherever you'd like to go. Well, Mike, I want to go to what has to happen in order for the character issues to not be center stage anymore. In other words, has he lost the room to such a degree that they need to have blowout performance and growth in an area that is yet to be identified? Well, going back to the, the CFA, the, the, the basis on how I should perform my job, it is the job of a CEO to uphold the reputation of the firm. So that is important. But when we talk about upholding the reputation of the firm, we're talking about being number one in advisory for the last 20 years. We're talking about Goldman growing 
capital markets twice the pace of peers over the last you know three or so years. We're talking about reputation of the firm to their multinational companies, to governments, to their most important investors. So where it matters the most, they are upholding the reputation of the firm based on the business that they're doing. But could there be a point where there's enough upheaval that you know the the media the the, the tail wags the dog. I suppose it's possible. It's just not going to happen, well, you know, right now. Mike, you said that the the turnover that we've seen in the partner ranks hasn't been that unusual, and yet we're hearing about Lloyd Blankfein being brought back to the firm and really going after David Solomon, having some pretty strong words for him. What do you make of that? I mean, do you think that just basically there are a lot of bitter people talking to members of the media? You know what I really think is happening here? I think it's, uh, and I don't have the numbers back this up, so I'm just going to give ballpark numbers, but I think it's like, you know, traders who are earning $6 million a year who got paid down last year to $4 million a year or something like that, uh, it just zip code-wise. I mean, they had a blowout year in 2021. Uh, last year was a bad year for Goldman. People were paid down when they had great years. They were partly subsidizing this failed foray in consumer banking, and they're they're upset, and they're taking their and they probably go to the CEO, and the CEO it's like, look, when has the Goldman Sachs CEO been a warm and fuzzy person? David Solomon, I mean, you have to have you know strong opinions to change your culture like he's doing while trying to generate profitability. I think a lot of people right. are are upset about what they're getting paid, and they're going to the press with it. Mike, you're expert on board analysis. We have a new board member, Mr. Montag, obviously uh, Goldman Sachs Timber over at Bank of America. He returns. You've got someone like David Vinier who ran the ship in 2007 under crisis. Color the board makeup and decision right now. How do you look at the Goldman Sachs board? Uh, Tom, you know, I've been a critic of bank boards, and it probably represents corporate boards you know, more generally, I feel like they're soft. They don't really hold management accountable. Uh, they don't listen to shareholder concerns. So when I look at Goldman Sachs board more than anything else, like any bank board, I think their push for change is probably not that much. Uh, that That's the re- reality of corporate America. And, you know, I've, I wrote my book about it and I still see it. And I you know, there's some other banks today I'm happy to talk about where I think there's much more need for change than, than at, at Goldman Sachs. So, uh, you know, wait in, <laughs> wait in line. And I do want to uh, address your Lloyd Blankfein comment. Um, you know, he Lloyd Blankfein started the push of consumer seven years ago, and he amplified. And it took up, you know, all the discussion in the room almost in, in the meetings. And now David Thomas doubled down on consumer, but it was Lloyd originally, and and Lloyd probably doesn't like to be, you know, tainted with some of these, you know, three billion dollars of losses they're getting out of, you know, the Marcus business aside from the deposits. So, um, you know, his hands aren't completely clean in this whole situation either. Mike, we've got about sixty seconds left. If we could finish by asking you a pointed question, that would be good. How would this stock respond if that headline dropped across the Bloomberg that he was out? I don't think the stock would go up. In fact, the stock might even go down. Um, so that's remember um, I called for the to have the Citigroup CEO fired um, back around after the global financial crisis, and I think the stock went up that day, and that was a good moment. And we've seen that uh, other places um, where the CEO goes. But if David Solomon were to be fired today, I think the stock would actually go down because then it would be like, wow, you're running the company based on media reports as opposed to financial results. And by the way, when I talk to investors. Investors aren't saying, oh, get rid of David Solomon. They're really asking the questions you're asking. Hey, does the media impact their performance? Um, I'd say no so far. Yeah. Having said that, David Solomon has to earn his job every day. And so I can come back in three months or six months and he doesn't get the job done. I'll be on the other side. We appreciate your opinion, Mike, as always. Mike Mayo of Wells Fargo. It's a question we've asked all morning. Is it strategic or deeply personal? And you have conversations like that, and it just feels more and more like it's deeply personal within the bank. Mike Mayo there of Wells Fargo. Your equity market just about unchanged on the S&P 500. From New York, good morning. Bloomberg 
is Surveillance on Monday in August, and we have been remiss. John Farrell preparing for the next hour, Lisa Bramitz and Tom Keen. And, you know, I've barely discussed this, but on the radar this week is a fair amount of economic data, starting with something that really matters. For the first time this morning, we discuss retail sales tomorrow. Yeah. We're, what have we been doing? Yeah. China this, China that. John's mentioned Goldman it. Sachs, we said we've mentioned sales. it. And then we've got Walmart on Thursday. And on <clears throat> Wednesday, we've got Target. Retail sales coming out tomorrow at 8.30 a.m. at a time where the U.S. consumer seems to be pitted against all of these macro concerns because the consumer keeps spending. And that has been the story. And so we will get the latest read on that with the expect- expectation of a reacceleration. Of, uh, of 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 some retail spending. Fed minutes, I believe it's the 16th. Wednesday, yeah. Wednesday, Fed minutes, do I care? Yeah, I think just to see if there's a shift in tone in terms of not, you know, being that aggressive or letting some sort of soft landing percolate out. I'll let you read them. Right now we're going to dive into the American economy and get you ready for this economic week, particularly in the American consumer. Pusha Shiram joins us, U.S. economist at Barclays, for a good discussion here. Futures were green on the screen. They've rolled over a little bit. Yields nicely higher, uh, three up, three basis points in the 10-year yield. And I'm watching FX, 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 where I've got yen still weakening. There is a movable feast in Pacific Rim currency uh, this morning. Uh, uh, Lisa, look at sterling, 126.65. I mean, there's some movable parts here on a Monday. One of the movable parts in mystery is the American consumer. Pusha Shiram is U.S. economist. Barclays, what's the state of the American consumer? What will you look for in retail sales data? Yeah, well, uh, thanks for having me on the show. I think um, the U.S. consumer still remains extremely resilient. I mean, from the last time I was here, we really haven't seen much in the way of either hard or soft data to suggest that things could be slowing. Um, As for retail sales this week, uh, we think it's going to be a pretty strong print. We're expecting a 0.4% increase on the month. Some of this, um, you know, could plausibly be an Amazon Prime Day <clears throat> event-led boost, which typically, you know, seems to be the case for the July reading. Um, but you know, even outside of that, uh, we think there is still a fair amount of momentum in consumer spending. Um, we also, you know, tend to look at um, where uh, excess savings are headed. Um, you know, that pool of savings still seems to be, you know, a, a fairly decent pot. So, you know, okay, going well. by going by all of this. Um, Atlanta GDP now, 4.12%. Mm-hmm. You're saying there's an asterisk there because of Amazon Prime? Well, not an asterisk uh, there, Tom. I think they would have, uh, you know, that's that's a now cost. Uh, but, you know, to the extent that that's still a 4% handle, we think it's it could be a strong third quarter. So what happens with student loan repayments, which are supposed to start in October? What happens to the savings pool that's supposed to be whittled down? What happens to the fact that oil prices and gasoline prices are going up? None of this stuff really matters the at the end of the day. Well, I mean, but What's this is mean? yeah, but this is what people are asking, right? When yes, do we start to see that, that actually take a bite out of consumer spending? Yeah, that's that's a good question and you know, I think I think what we really need in order for some of the slowdown to materialize is to see monetary policy that's somewhat a little more restrictive. And I think that's 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 what you know that and I think that's what we've been saying. I think uh, we still think that there's one more hike that's that's likely. Uh, when the FOMC looks at the data, I think they're going to be, you know, Uh, convinced that economic outlook um, is positive. If anything, they actually upgraded their assessment of economic conditions in July. So So are you pushing back against people who say that we're sufficiently restrictive or overly restrictive right now, that the Fed funds rate actually is not yet restrictive at a time with this much growth? Yeah. So, you know, I think uh, that that's a fair point. And, you know, we've been looking at it this way. So late in the hiking cycle, Lisa, we're still seeing such a resilient economy. It's been very unusual, right? I mean, at 5.25 to 5.5, the Fed funds rate hasn't been at this level since mid-2007. And, you know, we're still in an economy which is showing no signs of slowing. So that really leads us to question, A, you know, has monetary policy really struggled to gain traction? And B, if so, what's really happening? And, you know, we, we put out a note to clients on Friday. Um, and, you know, there's there's been some new estimates from the New York Fed about R star, which is the natural rate of interest. Um, and, you know, some of these model estimates seem to suggest that this natural rate of interest um, 
could have, uh, you know, is possibly higher now. Like what? Um, like you know, high? about 50 basis points higher for the long run rate. But interestingly, they also have estimates for the short run ASTA, which is, you know, which you can compare to the Fed funds rate. And that's about where policy is right now. So it leads us to question, you know, what if policy really isn't as restrictive as right. one would generally think? Um, and, you know, really, the FOMC is, I'm sure, aware of these estimates, and that would definitely be on their radar screens, right. you know, when they make uh, future policy decisions. You were at London School of Economics where you have to look at the Phillips curve, the, the physical thing that Phillips invented in 1951 mm. to come up with Phillips curve dynamic on inflation in jobs. You tripped over the beverage curve, I'm sure, on the way to the lunchroom. Ah. The answer is, does that theory work? Is, are you flying blind now or you're making it up with data? Or can you and Chairman Powell actually have a theory? Well, I think the, these frameworks, Tom, are still pretty useful um, to the extent that, you know, we still have a Phillips curve. Yes, it's it's not dead, you know, as a lot of people make it out to be. That gives you a good starting point. Um, but yes, we're looking at the data. We're looking at the beverage curve to see where we are moving. It looks like we've shifted somewhat lower. So that's a move in the right direction. But I think the, <clears throat> the broader point that we want to make is, you know, maybe there is a little more room for policy to become restricted. We shouldn't celebrate so early about disinflation. I think that's something that we learned on, on Friday as well after the, right. hot, the hot PPI data. So um, I think there is, you know, some more room for progress. Or is the system, I mean, this goes to Jackson Hole. I hope there's a paper on this. We don't know yet at Jackson Hole. McKee no, McKee's the only one on the planet who knows what the papers are. He won't tell me what they are. But do you aggregate into a summed American economy analysis or do you have to disaggregate to be polite into two Americas or, dare I say, four or five Americas? Well, I think, you know, based on the data we have available, Tom, as economists, we have to work with the aggregate picture. Um, you know, even something like the savings rate, we don't really have a clear uh, picture of what's happening at different income decile levels. So we are looking at the aggregate America to get a good sense of where the economy is headed. We're speaking with Pooja Sriram of Barclays ahead of the retail sales data that we get tomorrow. And also, of course, in light of what we're seeing internationally. And one of the big themes that we've been having uh, today is this question of when does some of the problems that we see percolating out of China start to make a dent in U.S. economic growth? Are they so divorced from one another that it doesn't ultimately matter this time around? Yeah, that's a good. That's a good question. So I think a lot of that is is sentiment for sure. Um, what's happening in China? Um, we we take particular interest in terms of the inflation that that spillover from China into into US. I think um, that disinflation narrative really supports what we're seeing in the US, especially on the good side. So that should be good news. But really, we've got to wait and watch to see if if it's enough to dent the resilience that we've seen in the US. Uh, economic activity so far. Well, there's a question also around oil prices, and they've mm -hmm. been picking up in large part because of the supply contraction out of Saudi Arabia, but also this idea that, yes, China was weak, <coughs> but they would be stimulating on some capacity. So you would see some little boost there. At what point are high oil prices inflationary versus disinflationary, deflationary, given how much it takes out of the paychecks of U.S. consumers? Sure. I think, um, you know, to your point, we're already uh, expecting to see the impact of a higher oil price in the August CPI report. And, you know, I think a lot of people have pointed that out. Um, to the extent that this can continue to seep into non-core components, what, what we need to really look at is the pace of increase in oil prices and whether they will sustain. I think that's something that we will be watching very closely to see how that plays out um, for the inflation narrative in the U.S. I want you to fold in with the markets moving right now, something that's acclaimed of Barclays Economics for years is the ability to bring foreign exchange into this. The fact is on a Monday morning before retail sales tomorrow and that I have a renewed stronger dollar. There's yuan, which with all its obviousness is weaker yuan, but I have dollar yen slipping away. There's no other way to put it. I've got yen 145.00, suddenly 145.38. I've got sterling well under a 120. Seven as well. Are you, when you link in to Barclays' strategy, can you can you link in and make some form of dollar conviction, or is it just a mess right now? Well, I think some of this is <clears throat> is a lot of as a reflection of the resilience and strength in the U.S. economy vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. So I think some of the move is that. Um, but yeah, I think we'll have to watch out how the data play play out. 
look at what's happening in the U.S. vis-a-vis what's happening in the rest of the world to really get a sense of where the fundamentals are headed. Mr. Jerome Powell, as he goes to Jackson Hole, as the central banker for the world, to me is far more than what's in the zeitgeist. Say that again. Is sorry. he a central banker to the world right now? I'm stealing well, from Bill Rhodes. Well, really, I think the whole world is is going to be watching him quite keenly to see what he has to say. Um, it's a great stage for them to to outline how they're thinking about policy at this stage. Um, you know, a lot of people seem to be convinced that they can engineer a soft landing. So, you know, we'll be looking mm-hmm. for clues to see how they're really looking at the economy, what they're making out. All right. Pooja, yeah. thank you. Pooja Sriram with us with Barclays uh, this morning. Lee, so we got to go back here to markets on the move. Equities peel away a little bit. We had a little bit of a game. We got some negative. <coughs> Excuse me. I got VIX up a stick, 15.92, getting to uh, where we are. But you really wonder if there's news out there right now. I've got sterling off a cliff, 127 to 126.60. These are little moves, but in the doldrums of August, they're tan- tangible. I mean, where does yen stop? 145.35? I can't believe I'm framing that right now. <laughs> right. And at what point do they come in and intervene? I'm looking, watching the front end of the yield curve because a lot of the sell-off has been at the back end. But today we're seeing it more at the front end, a little bit more with this idea exactly to Pooja's point. At what point does the Fed have to consider getting more restrictive if the rate hikes that they have uh, implemented <laughs> haven't had the impact? I mean, you were pointing to earlier today, 7.35% 30-year bank rate on the mortgage. 30-year mortgage. When does that start to affect home prices more? Well, I, uh, yeah, I would two-part it to the oddities of urban idiocy like New York City. We're all living this here uh, versus what I'm seeing out west, which is some tan- tangible rent declines. It, you know, it's a, it's a generalization west of the Mississippi River. Well, and the rent Maybe has west been, of Denver. That's been one of the big arguments for disinflation <clears throat> is that the rent, uh, you know, declines will actually feed into that. But then in other areas, you're starting to see it reignite. Again, it just goes to this question. Is this just people who have termed out bond yields and so are able to avoid Avoid really understanding um, what this actually means for their bottom lines, or is it just that this is an economy with way more, way more power than people thought? And again, within the litmus paper of the system, we do have markets on the move. Sterling right now, 126.60. I know John will have a lot on this here in the next 20 minutes or, or so, but just giving way one through that important level, 126.60 uh, as well. Standard Poor's 500, bit red, down two tenths of a percent. Yeah, and Tom, I, I do think that that is the point, which is people are looking around for news on a quiet August, right? I mean, what were we hearing from yeah. Elsa Linos that everyone's on vacation, and so there's a lot of range-bound trading until then. Who's your Shriam, isn't <laughs> Neither are we. Uh, you haven't taken a lot, actually, of No, vacation. I'm due. I'm, I'm taking huge amounts of vacation, and I'm actually trying to get to China at the end of the year, and I'm not sure we can pull it off. Did you it's see that just they're not that open? They're opening up some of the routes, though. Did they're, you see that? I'm and a little maybe. optimistic, and you know, you mentioned last week where fairs are down domestically. They're a little bit down internationally, I would say, but it's still the silly season. You know, but this is ultimately <coughs> the question around some of the oil prices that are going up. The disinflation that we're seeing, how long can it last if you see oil prices truly going up? And believe me, I would like to see well, plane tickets. And the news flow that's out there right now, and we're searching for the news flow here of markets on the move, is Brent crude down a stick all of a sudden down 1.4%. I'm Brent, 85.63. Uh, West Texas, not making a dash for a 79 level, but 81.90 down $1.29 in West Texas Intermediate as well. I'm looking on a Monday, August, as Lisa mentions, is I guess the doldrums of the summer. I'm looking at where we are and just simply foreign exchange markets, and you go out to the little bit of a market, and all my radar's on dollar yen. I can't fathom uh, within the, the summer of Tokyo what they're dealing with now, a second intervention perhaps. Yeah, and as you said, it has less uh, impact with each time. I just, again... It- people trying to understand the China story. If you don't have a China that's China. recovering, I do agree with that. this to me is underpinning yeah. a lot of the uncertainty. Please stay with us more than an eventful Monday, uh, to say uh, the least. Coming up, Drew Mattis of Met Life, a timely conversation on radio, on television. This is Bloomberg Surveillance.
We are about uh, 45 minutes away from the U.S. Open, and we can see a bit of a fading in some of the action. And you mentioned this, Tom, earlier, that we are seeing stocks roll over after initially shrugging off some of the concerns around China with S&P futures down about two-tenths of a percent. Euro-dollar just basically stasis, but the dollar strength you can see pretty much uh, reasserting it's consistently. Tangible. It's tangible, which is interesting given <clears throat> Everybody calling for a weaker dollar. Uh, and then in the yield space, yields up, continuing their upward trajectory. 10-year yields, almost to 4.20. That is really a shocking moment, considering that we're taking out I, what happened over the past you know, four months. Yeah, I totally agree. Before we get to stock movers, that you have to take this all back to benchmark yields. And the 10-year United States yield is there. There's some German yields that are as important as well. But, you know, the the, the bottom line is a banner headline coming out. Now, a year of weakness back to July 6, where we are now. We may get a 108 on euro, which is shocking in itself. But I agree, all you can hold yourself onto here is benchmark analysis. And to me, as a 30-year mortgage, a benchmark statistic, I'm not sure. But nevertheless, wow, there it is, 7.35%. One day that would have been a really incredible statistic and people seem to be shrugging it off. And the single stock names, honestly, it's been an interesting morning of divergence. U.S. Steel really standing out after X. rejecting an offer <laughs> from Cleveland from Cliffs. Musk. Yeah, exactly. Maybe Elon Musk will get a hold of it. Basically, uh, rejecting an offer from Cleveland Cliffs. This was something that Cliff said that United Steel, uh, United States Steel had called the offer unreasonable. Steel later confirmed the response. It said that it's trying to find strategic uh, ways to manage its assets. But nonetheless, those shares up almost 30 percent at a time when the U.S., I'm assuming, would want to emphasize some of their industrial production. Well, there's a historical baggage here, and I'm sure it's not going to go to semi, you know, semiconductor factories in Ohio or whatever the, you know, the romance of the Biden administration is. But it's such a legacy of the nation. There's such a collective memory of X that it distorts any rational analysis I would do. Well, and it, but it comes at a time where the U.S. is looking to rival China in certain capacities, and the combination of these two would uh, create the second biggest, I believe, steel company worldwide. I also just quickly want to touch on Tesla, since those shares are lower after they cut prices over in China down about 3.1%. And this, again, is this a China story? Is this a Tesla story? Is this an EV story? Uh, Nikola, also interesting. It's uh, falling substantially more than and 18, about 18 percent. That's an electric vehicle maker, Tom. They had uh, some fire batteries that had an issue. I, I, this stuff scares the hell out of me. And I don't know what else so, to say. or there basically there was an electric uh, malfunctioning in the batteries, and so they are recalling certain vehicles, and those shares are lower. Right now, we're going to get a brief as we talk to uh, Pooja Shriram of Barclays. Right now, we step into a discussion of the markets with the economist Drew Mattis, chief market strategist. It met life. He was on. We had a huge response when Drew was on last time, so we reduced it again. Drew, are we amid disinflation and in selected economies outright deflation? Well, in the United States, if you look at goods prices, we're in deflation now for that. And the question is, how 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 pushy will service inflation be over the next couple of months, um, and and how long is that going to hold up overall inflation in the United States? Well, how long will it hold up inflation? But the answer is we have to fold this into our market belief. How do you, with all your claim going back to Ethan Harris, Maury Harris and all, you only work for people named Harris. I guess that's what we learned uh, there. But, you know, Drew, I look at the economics of Drew Madison. I say, OK, I can go into a guess on what price is going to do. Then how do you fold that into a market analysis? Well, I, you know, for, for me right now, what I'm focused on and inflation is one of them is imbalances. Uh, you know, what kind of imbalances exist and what does that mean for the economy and growth going forward? Uh, and so for the medium term, I'm trying to figure out when the recession occurs, how deep it's going to be, what's going to cause it. Um, and quite frankly, kind of the longer the imbalances persist, the worse the recession will be and, and the more you have to worry about it. Uh, and so things like you were talking about earlier with regard to housing, you know, housing, is, housing should be repricing. The fact that it's not is not a sign of, of health. It, it's a sign of dysfunction. Um, and I, I think that that's something that could come back to bite us in terms of, you know, we, we begin to generate some momentum in the economy and all of a sudden people want, need to move for, for work or, or when they've retired, they want to sell their house and switch to a different house. 
um, you know, there are no trade downs happening anymore, right? If you've hit retirement age and you wanted to switch to a smaller house, there's no point, right? Because you'll end up with um, the same same mortgage payment and a smaller house. So why would you do that to yourself? Um, and, and so that kind of dysfunction creates problems for the economy uh, that'll come back and reverberate uh, for the next you know, couple of quarters at least. How do higher oil prices fall into your thesis of rapid disinflation? Well, so that creates another distortion, right? Should we, in a time where it seems like growth is coming back into kind of a more uh, sustainable trajectory and everyone's talking about a soft landing, should oil prices be behaving the way they are? Should they be behaving the way they are when we see weakness overseas in, in markets that typically import a lot of oil? Um, you know, so once again, you know, something that doesn't quite fit a narrative uh, that's being put out of kind of a soft landing and all's right with the world. Um, and so I think it's something important to watch for going forward. How much are you watching China? I mean, this morning we've been really uh, focused on what happened over in China with cons- respect to their developer, with respect to a private wealth manager not being able to necessarily make payments on some of the products that it uh, had tied to real estate and other types of investments. How much of an effect would some of that weakness have on the U.S. economy or have these two economies diverged enough for it not to really make a material difference? Well, I, I don't think I don't think they've diverged that far, right? Um, in the same way that if you had material weakness in the United States, it would translate to China. If you have material weakness in China, I think it'll translate into the United States. Uh, you know, th- there might be a little bit more of a delay in getting here, and there might be um, you know a, a different a different routes that it takes. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think you know you end up in the same place, which is in order for the U.S. economy to be doing well, uh, in order for the global economy to be doing well. Um, you know, all, all the boats have got to be moving in the same direction. Um, and, and right now they're not. Uh, you have more weakness in parts of the world and you have, you know, kind of strength in the United States. Uh, and, and once again, something that doesn't seem sustainable in the long run. Uh, and so that's something that's, you know, uh, caught my attention. And I think it is worth focusing on uh, as we as we move forward yeah. and try to figure out where we're going to be. Drew, I don't want to use you in trouble with the general counsel of MetLife, but I have to ask you, not so much the nitty gritty of MetLife, Metropolitan Life and commercial real estate and all the huge investment that you have there and, you know, the mathematics of it to the point. But how does Drew Mattis synthesize how CRE fits into your risk profile? Is it overplayed? Should everyone calm down or is it a tangible fear? Well, you know, I... So, Tom, I'm going to duck that one. I'm going to, you know, we have a great real estate team, a yeah. uh, great real estate research team, uh, and and I would defer to them on that. You know, you, I'm sure you can reach out and. and oh come on, you're on with us now. I mean, you know, there's nobody watching in August. Just the CRE, thumb up, thumb down at MetLife. <laughs> look, every every asset class you could possibly look at is always going to have good places to be and bad places to be. Right. And, and so, you know, having having the kind of research that we have available at MetLife, you know, allows us to kind of better insight into that area. Boy, did he answer that was great. I think it's like Powell at a press conference. Drew was reading that off a card. Drew Mattis, thank you so much at MetLife for that non-answer on commercial real well, estate. I, maybe I shouldn't have asked him. Most before. controversial thought of the day, maybe. Actually, probably not. Uh the idea that commercial real estate is coming back because people are going back to the offices and this idea that work from home uh, is kind of losing luster in some places. I'm reading. I was stopped on the street, walking around the Manhattan streets. This happens to Lisa and John, too. We get stopped all the time. And I was stopped by a major hitter in real estate months ago. And he said, it's just simple. There's a class A partition with class B, class C real estate. And, of course, MetLife only owns the creme de la creme. But then beyond class A property is which kind of commercial real estate. I'm trying to read as much as I can about the certitude of office buildings are not a good place to be. But what about apartments? What about multifamily? You know, there's other places to go. You know what? I just don't understand. This is a very U.S. phenomenon. Self-storage and the massive amounts of self-storage when you drive across the country. Have you ever had a self-storage unit? No, I have never to this day. I've never had one. I'm really big on throwing stuff out. But it is. It is a nation of pack rats, and self storage <laughs> is the way to go. I mean, vet vet bill's got really five. Vet bill's got 500 square feet over on the East oh, River. Oh yeah, what's he got? 
you know, treats, winter Lots of stuff, treats. coats, treats. <laughs> got the little green chewy <laughs> treats. Does he have. have little Crocs? Thank you to our team today, particularly for that conversation with Michael Mayo. This is Bloomberg. Good morning.